and we are live. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to this special committee of the whole planning and administration uh, taking place on a Thursday afternoon, which is exceptionally rare, but uh, due to the volume of work, we could not fit in the planning applications as we no would normally do on a Tuesday night. So I'd ask you to please stand if you're able as I read the invocation to begin the meeting. As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities laid upon us. Our council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who've served our community who are no longer with us so that we can continue to do the work that we must in their memory. Please be seated. Deputy Clerk, would you please take the roll? Councillor Martin? Here. Councillor Vanderstel? Present. Councillor Carpenter? Here. Councillor McCreary? Here. Councillor Socoli? Present. Councillor Sless? Present. Mayor Davis? Present. So members of the committee, either attending in person or virtually, Councillor Sless, does anybody have a pecuniary interest they need to declare regarding any of the items that are on today's agenda? If so, uh, physically raise your hand or raise it electronically. <clears throat> Not seeing any raised hands. We'll go into separation then. So there's only one item for consideration, 7.1.1, beyond the statutory hearing matters. Um, would any member of council like that separated for discussion purposes? Seeing no raised hands. So 7.1.1 is not separated. Councilor Martin, can you please move the motion to approve uh, the items for consideration, one of them in 7.1? Certainly. I move, second by Council McCurry, that all items for consideration, 7.1, not separated for discussion purposes, be approved. All right. Uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, would you please take the vote on that? Item 7.1.1575 Conklin Road, point three M reserved dedication carries unanimously on recorded vote of six to zero. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Marn, McCreary, Sless, Vanderstelt, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. And you can add that <clears throat> me to that I am here. All right, so we do have four statutory public hearings this afternoon. And after that we have two resolutions, and that is when Councillor Carpenter will resume the chair to complete the Committee of the Whole meeting. So we'll then proceed into the statutory public hearings. And uh, with the four hearings that are before us today, the purpose is to be held in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. The purpose of the hearings is to discuss the planning application and to hear from the public either in support of or in opposition to the application. At the end of the public portion of the meeting, the public hearing, the committee will then pass a recommendation which is generally considered for final decision at the next meeting of council, which would be the final Tuesday of this month. The procedure we follow is that the applicant speaks first, followed by municipal planning staff and then the public. The applicant then has an opportunity at the end of that to provide clarification to any questions or issues that are raised during the meeting. So we'll now proceed right into the first item, which is 5.1. It's uh, application for zoning bylaw amendment PZ 2020 12 Fisher Street. <clears throat> I'd now ask the applicant please to appear the, on behalf of Don Victoria Homes, I believe it's web planning consultants. If you would please state your name, confirm who it is you're representing, and then proceed.
Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, your worship, and ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for turning my back. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon in this new chamber. It's uh, quite a nice change from where we've been previously. My name is James Webb. I'm a professional land use planner based in the city of Hamilton, and I'm speaking to you today on behalf of, of the owner and the proponent for this development application, Don Victoria Homes. At the outset, let me indicate um, we've had an opportunity to review the staff report that's before you today with respect to an application for a zoning bylaw amendment, and we're in um, full agreement with the, the content of that report, the evaluation, and the conclusions that have been reached by the City of Brantford um, planning staff. Uh, it's my understanding that there's been a modification to that recommendation to um, address additional issues with regards to a holding provision, um, and lifting of a one foot reserve. And I'd like to say at the outset, that we're in full agreement with the modifications to that recommendation. And I'm before you today, uh, respectively seeking your approval of, of that staff recommendation. <clears throat> if I may, I'd like to provide you a brief overview of, of where we've been with this development proposal, um, how it's evolved over the years um, through consultations with staff and the neighborhood and, and through the input, um, the guidance of the ward councilors to the matter that's before you today in terms of the specifics of the development proposal. Wonderful, I didn't turn the lights off. Um, on the slide before you is, is an image that shows the location of the subject property. It's a 1.68 hectare piece of land um, located in the southwest area of the city. The property has frontage onto Sheldard Lane and uh, also frontage onto interior streets, Nightingale and Fisher Street. It's within a quadrant that, if I show you the next slide, provides you some context with regards, excuse me, there's just further images of, of the, um, the property itself in terms of its streetscape. Sheldard Lane is the bottom photograph. You'll see the multi-purpose walkway that goes across the front of the property. Uh, the photo at the top shows Nightingale. It's improved to a certain degree and developed as intended um, across the frontage of the property. The sidewalks are yet to be extended and obviously will be done at development stage of the subject property. But you can see today it's, it's a vacant property awaiting development. And from the next image, you'll understand that in fact, you know, the beginnings of this property in terms of what it's to be used for began back in 2005 when the city adopted official plan amendments and zoning bylaw amendments to implement what's called, and I'll probably get the name wrong, excuse me, but phase three of the Debogene Forest Estates plan of subdivision. And as you can see from the plan, um, the development block is that large block in the bottom right hand corner. Um, a budding sheltered lane, um, you'll see there's a block Number 86, that's a one foot reserve that was put in place with the intention of, of blocking access to Shellard Lane. You'll see frontage along Nightingale, wherein the lands were intended to take their direct access at some future date when the development came forward. You'll also note to the left of the property, a block number 84 that was set aside at the time of development approvals to facilitate a public walkway connection between Shellard Lane and Nightingale Avenue. It's yet to be completed, but that's something that my client has offered to do as part of his site development works to actually build out that access as originally intended. So what you, what you see from this image is, is, is a block had created almost 17 years ago that was intended at its time through those official plan amendments and zoning bio amendments for medium density development. It was, it was zoned R4A, which permits townhouses. It was designated medium density residential since inception of this subdivision, there has always been the clear intent to develop these lands for medium density residential use, not, not single detached, not low density, but, but medium density housing, which includes townhouses. The planning framework for the town, and again, I'll go through this quickly, but you have the more fulsome discussion within the staff report. The lands are within the urban boundary for the city of Brantford. Um, they are outside of the built up boundary and therefore subject to the greenfield policies and the emphasis of greenfield policies is achieving appropriate um, and emphasis on appropriate, appropriate intensification of lands within that greenfield area. Um, the official plan, you'll be well aware that the city's now adopted a new plan. Previously, the lands were designated medium density residential. You've now gone to a more broad and a more um, descriptive category of just residential, which permits all forms of residential development, low, medium, and high density development, 
but the new change that the that, that substantive is that the city now relies on rather than prescribing densities and building heights you've adopted a set of comprehensive urban design guidelines that are now meant at a design basis to determine what in fact is appropriate on any given site based on contextual consideration urban design considerations fit and compatibility at the end of the day planners would package all of that into just good planning <coughs> So the zoning, as I said, again, was implemented back in 2005. These lands have been zoned in the R4A category, which does permit a mix of townhouse dwellings to a maximum of three stories of height. We're proposing to modify that zoning with some site-specific exceptions that are in setbacks, minor relief, uh, minor relief on parking, <clears throat> and minor uh, reductions with respect to the minimum areas per unit. We've also, as you'll see, we're introducing a, a transitional use on this property to buffer the existing residential uses, the single family homes from a higher density development by actually introducing single family homes onto that portion of, of the site that abuts on Nightingale Drive. Um, it did require at the time an official plan amendment, effectively a down designation to allow us to introduce those single family homes on Nightingale. The specifics of the proposal is that we're proposing a draft plan of condominium, or excuse me, a vacant land plan of condominium, which allows us to create all of the individual units and the common elements. And the common elements being obviously the parking areas, maneuvering areas, um, amenity space, and visitor parking. There are, with the final development, a total of 104 dwelling units. Again, the six single family dwellings on Nightingale. And then interior to the site, three types of townhouses. Um, traditional two-story block townhouses that are located to provide for a transitional use backing onto single family homes. There's 60 stacked townhouses, which is essentially um, unit above unit in a townhouse form, which is an appropriate way to achieve densities within that same building mass of a traditional townhouse and 26 rear lane townhouses that are facing on the shelter. And I'll get into the details of those in a moment. And again, we're not seeking any changes in the height. The maximum height is, is accepted at three stories and the parking for the development has been laid out in the manner that we're achieving 1.5 spaces per unit in the context of your zoning bylaw, it's slightly less because the zoning bylaw doesn't let us count spaces that are located within garages. <laughs> As I said, the project has undergone, since we began this development proposal three years ago, we've undergone a significant number of changes and revisions to address comments from staff, comments from the neighborhood and, and ongoing discussions with ward councillors. At the outset, the entirety of the development was proposed as townhouses, two points of access from Nightingale, um, generally a similar unit, 118 total units with 138 parking spaces. That's what we presented a preliminary, excuse me, a pre-consultation meeting with your staff. And some concerns were noted about that, in particular, the interface of those units on Nightingale and how would two points of access function onto that existing street. So when we began our planning process, obviously, you know, taking into account that, that valuable feedback, the development proposal at the outset was modified. We show, as you can see on this image, the Nightingale frontage is proposed to be developed with six single family detached homes that will not be part of the condominium. They'll have their own direct access onto Nightingale. And then the balance of the property becomes the medium density development as intended by um, the prior zoning and, and the official plan policies. Um, at the outset, again, you know, just minor shifts, but we had 104 units in total and 149 parking spaces. That's the development proposal that was reviewed by your staff and the various commenting agencies, city divisions, and through additional discussion, um, with we had an open house with the neighborhood and we began to hear feedback in terms of their concerns. What were their issues? How did they envision these lands being developed? Notwithstanding that it had existing planning permissions for medium density, what were the concerns with our project? And we, we listened to that and we subsequently came up with what is before you today as, as our final development concept wherein we've been able to increase the number of on-site parking spaces to achieve a total, as I said, of 149 spaces. The number of units remains essentially static, a total of 104 dwelling units. Uh, we maintain now just a single point of access onto Nightingale. But what you will see from the proposal um, is our attempt, and again, and please appreciate, the matter before you today is a zone change application, but 
in current planning, you know, you can't um, talk about a zone change without details of what your development proposal looks like. And that's why we effectively get to a site plan level of detail at this stage of the process. We're not seeking site plan approval today, but we've essentially crafted a bylaw around this concept. And one of the key concepts that we've now incorporated to the plan in response to feedback that we're hearing from the neighborhood is to propose an additional site access. The concern that we heard from the neighborhood was concerned with respect to traffic impacts essentially from those from that arterial road to the collector roads to the local streets. So what we've proposed on this that's been submitted and reviewed by staff is to propose a right in right access onto Shellard Avenue. You can see that in the bottom left hand corner of the development proposal. Um, it's been reviewed by staff. They initially, uh, my understanding is that staff were not in support of this for a range of reasons and I'll, I'll have my traffic consultant speak. She's in the virtual world and is going to participate in a moment, uh, Erica Bailey, um, in response to those traffic concerns. But this is the proposal that's before you. And as I understand it, the amended recommendation today from staff would in fact implement this development proposal and that the one foot reserve would be partially lifted on Shellard Avenue in order to facilitate this limited movement access. Again, just a quick overview of the product. So at the, at the north limit of the site, backing onto the homes that front onto Fisher, we have traditional two-story um, block townhouses. The end units are designed with side entry. They actually have two garage spaces and two driveway spaces. So four parking spaces in total, which helps again, increase the number of spaces on the site. These are the stacked townhouse products, which have been sited essentially internal to the site, away from the existing and adjoining low density housing. Again, stacked townhouses are a very efficient way to increase densities on a development. You essentially can double the number of units, but within that same building envelope, the scale and the massing is the same as a traditional three-story townhouse, but you're able to increase the number of units. And lastly, proposed along the street frontage and you know, having just driven just to re-familiarize myself with Shellard. Shellard is an arterial road and no points of access are permitted to individual units. So you have a mix there. You can actually see the continuum of how, of how planning and design has evolved over the years. Traditionally, units backing onto an arterial road would just be that. They would back onto it and there'd be a wooden fence and there'd be no interconnection between the public space and the private space. That has since evolved and developments are either incorporating window streets where there's adequate land or the proposal what we have before you today, which is called a rear lane product, which effectively means that these units have two faces. The face that will front onto Shellard is designed as though it's, it's the front elevation. It creates an activity space where there will be in fact a direct connection between the units, the people that live in those units and, and the public realm. And here you will in fact have an active public realm because of that municipal multi-purpose walkway across the front. So there's front doors, there's porches. People are not allowed to enclose them or screen them. They're designed to really improve and, and, and you know, build on community and neighborhoods through that interaction. So through the processing of the application, um, effectively I can boil all of the past couple of years down into these issues. There's concern with respect to traffic impacts being raised by the neighborhood. There are concerns with regards to parking and concerns with respect to density and built form. In a moment, I'm gonna have Erica speak to you virtually. She's our traffic engineer, Erica Bailey. She's gonna to speak to the traffic impacts. We believe that the parking supply that we've proposed for this development is appropriate with the fundamental principle that there's enough parking on this development that there won't be overflow parking. Understand and recognize when you're doing infill development, there's existing streets. Um, there may be the necessity down the road to look at further opportunities for how the the municipality and the developer can work together in terms of on-street parking controls, in terms of enforcement, if there's concerns with respect to people and their ability to want to be able to park on that street, this development is not intended by nature of the number of spaces we're providing to exacerbate any existing conditions with respect to on-street parking. Density and built form, as I said, effectively we've done a down designation on a portion of the property. So that results in a slightly increased density on the balance. Again, we're at a total net density in the range of 63, which is certainly within the realm of a medium density development proposal. We feel that the density is supported by its location. This really is within a part of the city that's evolving as, as a mixed use and complete neighborhood. There's opportunities to walk and certainly with the immediate proximity to transit, 
parks, schools, everything, you know, we foresee that this density is appropriate for what you're trying to achieve within greenfield areas. And with that, if I may, and I will defer to the technical experts, if, if Eric can be, or excuse me, if Eric can, Erica can be introduced virtually, she was just gonna speak quickly to the, the traffic issues. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Erica Bailey with Paradigm Transportation, and we were retained to prepare the transportation impact assessment for this development. And just to give a bit of detail about the traffic volumes in the area. So for the development concept that James outlined, we forecast um, 56 a.m. and 65 p.m. peak hour trips from this development. Um, our study was prepared based on a terms of reference reviewed with the city, and this included an evaluation of seven nearby intersections. Included in our analysis were five background developments, um, and that includes the Southwest Sports Park and other surrounding future residential developments. We found that the impact of this specific development on those seven intersections was less than two seconds of an increase in delay. Uh, we found that all these intersections were forecast to continue to operate with acceptable levels of service. Um, so that's regarding the intersection operations. Regarding the volumes on the surrounding road network, um, in particular for McGinnis, which is um, designated as a minor collector in the OP and is designed to accommodate up to 8,000 vehicles per day. Um, which is based on the city's design and construction manual. We found that the existing volumes on McGinnis are about 770 per day, and the forecast volumes are about 1,200. So understanding that this street is designed to accommodate up to 8,000, we're well below this threshold, including all the other surrounding developments that we um, included in our analysis. Um, similarly for Conklin, which is also a minor collector, um, the existing volumes are about 3,000 per day, and our forecast volumes, uh, it'll go up to about 5,700, again, well below the 8,000 vehicle threshold. For the local streets within the neighborhood, um, Yarrington, Nightingale, and Fisher, um, these streets are designed to accommodate up to 2,000 vehicles per day, given their classification as a local street. We found the existing volumes are approximately um, 350 to 400 per day, and with the addition of the, um, the background developments and this particular development, we found that this would go up to about 400 to 600, which is again, well below the 2000 vehicle per day threshold. So um, all that is to say that we found that all streets are currently operating within their intended classification as outlined by the city and the addition of the background developments and this development will not put them over um, their design thresholds. That's all for me. Uh, thank you very much for that, Erica. And Erica will remain available should there be any follow-up questions. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll just conclude my comments. Um, I do have some additional imagery with respect to some of the product that's been built by Don Victoria Homes. They're, in fact, actively working on Park Road North right now. But, um, again, it's, it's our respectful submission um, requesting your adoption of, of the recommendation as amended that's before you today. Uh, we'd like to continue on with the process and advance this application next to its detailed design phase through site plan control and plan of condominium. Um, and again, we're in full support with the, the modified recommendation. And just to close, I'll just run through some quick imagery of some existing product that's been built by this developer. They're, they're well established and um, what I would like you to take away from the imagery is that Don Victoria Homes is, is, is one of the industry leaders in terms of architecture, built form considerations and design details. They use the highest quality of building materials in their projects, whether it's stone or brick, um, varied architecture. Um, they respond to local contextual considerations where applicable. Um, this is a development on Plains Road in Burlington, excuse me, the, the preceding one was a development on Barton Street in Hamilton. Um, this is an example of a, of a quad form of, of housing. Again, you know, take from that the, the varied roof profiles, the attention to the window detailing. This is an interesting development. It has side garages that, again, give prominence to the facade of, of, of the entry point and the windows as opposed to the garages. Um, this is the development that's actually proceeding as we speak on Park Road North. It was before this committee a couple of years ago. It's, it's a, again, a similar plan of condominium. Um, the sales have been fantastic. The product is very well received. 
quite similar parking, um, if I may, parking regulations adopted by committee and council for that development as are proposed today. And, and lastly, um, examples of very single family homes. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation. I'm, I'm happy to come back if there's any questions from committee following any of the additional submissions from staff or the area residents. And thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you very much, Mr. Webb. And uh, just stay where you are in case we have any questions. So committee members, does name Councilor Martin. Thank you. You said with the, the latest design, you've reached 1.5 parking spaces per unit. That is correct. If, if you take into account um, the way that your zoning bylaw counts the spaces, we don't get credit for the spaces that are within the garages. Uh, the bylaw doesn't currently recognize tandem parking. So notwithstanding that there's spaces on the driveway and the garage, we only can count for zoning compliance one or the other. So okay. we're, at, we're at a ratio of 1.35, which is part of the site specific modification. But if you take into account what's proposed, um, you know that's how we say that the development is in fact achieving the intent of the bylaw. Oh, so 1.5 that you're talking about includes the garage spaces. Yes, it does. And the site specifics in the bylaw by staff are, are in support of the minor rounding down, well, not a rounding down, but a, a minor reduction to 1.35 spaces per unit. And how many townhouses have garages? All of them or just some of them? No, it's it's, it's just the, the two-story back-to-backs, excuse me, the two-story units at the back of the development. So there's a total of 12 of those, and those, the end units actually have four spaces per unit. So that's how we get from 10 townhouse units, 12, and, and a, a, a doubling up of the number of spaces there. And the, uh, the stacked ones, they're three and a half stories, I assume? Um, you said there was a limit of three stories, but it looks like there's yeah, living the, the, spaces. Yeah, no, the, the living space is restricted to three stories. That's just a decorative element. And there, there's dormer windows built into that roof line, but that's purely decorative. So it's, it's a well, three story living unit. space up there? No. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions, sir. Councillor Vanderstel. I hope I have time, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> got the time. We've all got the time. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Um, Mr. Webb, uh, thank you for your presentation. Appreciate it very much. Um, wh when, um, when did Don Victoria Homes decide that they were going to uh, be okay with putting single family homes um, on the Western portion of that site? When did, when did that decision happen? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, that decision was made before we proceeded with the, the actual detailed development application. So it was following the pre-consultation meetings um, with staff and before the applications were formally submitted. And Mr. Chairman, if, if you'll allow me in a moment, sorry, I'll just finish with that question first. Sorry, pardon me. So, so that, that decision, yes, that was, decision was made at, at the outset. When we, when we began the formal planning act process, we were including um, those six units facing on the night and go. Okay, and by how many dwelling spaces did we drop by doing that? Sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I know we're no, at no. 104 now, but we started- That's why I made notes. Uh, at, the out, at the outset, we were at 118 units in totality, which was entirely townhouses. We're now down to 104. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I misspoke in my response to uh, the first question of the councillor. Um, the three-story units, they, it, it's not living space per se, but in, built into the roof profile is, is amenity space. So the stairwell comes up in within that roof peak. Um, it's not bedrooms, it's, it's not living space per se, but effectively there's a, there's a, the stairs come up, there's a landing, and then there's a, a, a door that opens out and you could see that if, if my slides were up, you could actually see that in the elevations for those units. What they've done is they've actually built an outdoor amenity space within that roof profile. So there's like a cutout with a balcony that overlooks. So it's, it's not living space per se, it's, it's a unique approach that Don Victoria Homes has done on proposing on this project. They did it on Park Road North. It's a way to meet the bylaw requirements with respect to outdoor amenity space. Sorry if I, if I misspoke in my response. All right, thanks for that clarification. Uh, Councilor McCurry, your next questions. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, in the uh, presentation you put on the screen, you used the phrase modal splits. Can you explain that, not using the word modal or split? <laughs> um, I, I may need to rely upon the expertise of, of Erica for this. Uh, modal splits um, is um, a descriptive 
a descriptor that's used to evaluate development proposals in terms of how people travel. Um, whether it's, you know, in a suburban context, you'd appreciate that it's, it's almost entirely 100% towards the automobile because maybe there's not yet transit, maybe there's not good cycling infrastructure, maybe there's not good, good pedestrian um, opportunities. In this location, the, not allowed to use those words, but the opportunities for people to travel is much less heavily weighted towards the automobile because of, of that range of considerations. First of all, there's places to go. Um, I hope that you won't see as many parents as you may normally see driving their kids to school because as I drive around the neighborhood, there's schools within immediate walking distance. There are shops, there are other public service facilities within immediate proximity, but there's also you know, other very good reasons and abilities that encourage what we will refer to as active transportation, walking and cycling. There's, there's phenomenal, phenomenal outdoor opportunities as well as passing across the front of the property, you have that multi-purpose trail. So it, it's, it's a measure and that essentially um, qualifies how the relationship of the reliance on the automobile and you know how much weight do we need to put the parking ratios based on the design of a project and its location sure. considerations. Now, harking back to the um, uh, to your your friend online, she cited a number of morning and afternoon trips in and out of the development. And I did I hear correctly that it would add fifty six vehicles in the morning. I can take this one. Um, the trip generation, um, correct. The AM peak hour is 56 and the PM is 65. And that's inclusive of the single units fronting on to Nightingale. Now, how many, how many units in total on the project? Remind me. 104, six, the six singles and the 98 townhouses. 104, okay. So you'd have parking for 140 cars or thereabouts. Um, now these aren't these are not going to be um, these are going to be it's sort of a prime development so one's going to need a pretty good salary to pay for these right um, which yeah. I think would imply that you probably have two people going to work out of every unit again um, you know we we haven't done to that degree of analysis we've we've targeted the project based on you know what we think is appropriate in terms of the parking supply. People will know when they when they tour the sales office in terms of the number of sales spaces that are available. The development is following a principle of unbundled parking, where it's not necessarily automatic that you know you have to buy one or two spaces. You can, in fact, if you're in that wonderful position of not having a car or one only one car, you need one space. So it, it it's it's designed in a manner to provide what we believe is is an adequate number of spaces without again causing any adverse impacts into the interior of the neighborhood in terms of overflow. My, my comment would be, I think, I think the number of peak trips is a bit skinny. Um, and I, I can appreciate why the folks that live on the uh, existing street are concerned. No, it wasn't a question, it was a comment, Mayor, thank you. Yep, we're at the part of the hearing where it's, it's questions only. So, Councillor Carpenter, you're next. Thank you. Uh, the walkway, pedestrian walkway, is it still in play here? Is it part of the process going out to Fisher? Through you, Mr. Chairman. So the, the lands were previously conveyed to the municipality. They, they have not yet been improved for their intended purpose. So in dialogue with the city's development engineering staff, we've made the offer that as part of our works that we'd be uh, pleased to complete that once we grade out our site, once we install a fence, that would just seem to be the logical time for us to assist the municipality. I think you may in fact be holding monies back from the original developer for that purpose, but um, it is intended to be completed. And we've certainly made submissions to your staff that um, while our you know, forces are mobilized on the property, that uh, there certain, seems to be a certain economy of scale there that we can readily finish that connection as intended. So you would know in that piece that would be an operational expense for the city to have a walkway access to your development? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, for some reason, I'm not able to hear that question clearly. So well, are you telling me that, that you don't own that piece that's uh, on the map here in yellow that um, goes into the walkway from Fisher directly into the development in between two six-story block townhouses? So for clarification, the, the walkway block that I'm referring to, it, it showed up on that one slide that I presented to you, the original plan of subject. That walkway block is, is not part of this development. It's exterior to the development and located on our west boundary. It's block 84 of the original plan of subdivision. 
the piece that was highlighted in yellow that's in the center between those two blocks that's that's part of the development that's that's a connection into the site but that's not to be confused with the walkway block that was intended to be established through the original plan of subdivision we are creating that amenity space as an additional entrance into the site but that's not the one again that was created through the plan of subdivision. Well, I'm, I'm only looking at the map that's provided that you provided that uh, shows all the block townhouses in the single single lots and then uh, on the bus early side is a walkway between two lot two single family lots and I was just trying to understand is are we going to have a development then that the city owns that and the city's going to be maintaining that in perpetuity into your your private development yeah, just for absolute clarity, if, if if I could perhaps put my slide back up so that we could look at the sure. same imagery and just to be absolutely clear. Yes, because I'd like to be clear. So, so there is the original phase three of the plan of subdivision. You can see our block. Our development proposal comprises all of block 83. Well, 83 it includes the piece that goes out the walkway that goes out to Fisher. Yes, excuse me. Sorry, there is there is a, that is a small remnant strip of land. Thank you. The graphic helps. So that is yours. That that is a piece of land, a remnant piece from when the plan of subdivision was created. Uh, we proposed to improve it with a walkway connection. Um, I'm not sure what else to do. It there is some municipal infrastructure that flows through underground a, a, a municipal storm drain that connects so are you prepared to own that piece and maintain that piece of perpetuity as part of the condominium corporations act and they give the easement for the infrastructure to the city yeah i see i see people yes. in the, i see mr peaver with raven okay so uh, then then that, that that's why i wanted to ask this because i have a question to go with that so the maintaining of the fences along the uh, north and south piece of that property they'll be maintained by the condo corporation could you have a privacy fence there for the walkway for the residents that live on the north and south side of the walkway? Is yeah, that's through you, Mr. Chairman. That's something we'd certainly commit to through the site plan process. So the, the type of fencing, the nature of the fencing, the location could be um, addressed at that stage. Okay, I, I want to make sure that that was going to be fenced and that the property tree or landscape, whatever that might be. Okay, and the on the on the east side of the boundary, you have a, a you have an access. Is there an access point to the street uh, from that amenity space? to, to uh, Shutter's Lane, directly opposite this laneway. Yes, right down there, yep. Where it says amenity space, is there an access point to the street from there? Uh, purely a pedestrian connection. Yeah, pedestrian connection, okay. And uh, we'll have to consider whether we have a pedestrian crosswalk there or how far it is from the access point yeah it's, it's it's not intended to be a through connection across shellard it's it meant really there are transit stops in the immediate proximity to where that amenity space is so it's it's thought of only as a connection to that existing multi-purpose uh trail that runs parallel to shellard lane okay and the fencing along the the um, seven stacks uh and then move it's the six stacks uh that back onto shellard's lane um there's no there's no backyards to those they back directly onto what is a fence is there any any there's no no back but green space behind those properties so to be clear we're speaking as to the block that's on the uh, left north hand. and south of the of the one we just talked about block seven and eight yes yes so there again that that rear lane product they have a face onto shellard they have um, designed into their units, their, their garages and their access is interior to development. They do have a, a form of um, contained elevated amenity space above the garages as a partial projection, and they have the benefit of that but, rooftop amenity space. But how far are they from the fence line that's going to be there? And how, and then we'll follow that up with how high is that fence going to be and what's it going to be constructed of? Again, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, that's that's a detail that we'll be addressing at the site plan approval stage. We haven't made specific um, submissions with regards to the type of the fencing, the height of the fencing. It'll obviously be in accordance with your bylaws. You know, anything that happens immediately adjacent to Shellard needs to be uh, there's there's a prohibition on any fencing that would prevent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would just encourage the staff to look at Linen Road that where we where we built sound barrier walls. Um, 
not made of wood that lasts for a long time because wood does deteriorate and 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 disintegrate and discolor. Anyways, okay, thank you. Uh, one more final one, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you've got six. You've put six single-family dwellings on uh, Nightingale, I believe it is. Now those six single. I mean, how wide are those lots? They're proposed at twelve meters. Twelve meters. Okay. Now, uh, what I would suggest here is, when you look at those lots, would you can you make some requirement that the driveways are either on the, the same side, so you end up having two driveways together, as opposed to a driveway separated by the full lot, which doesn't give you enough room for a car to park. But if you put the driveways together, so six and five driveways are kind of together with a little green space in between them. You follow me, and then there's a larger green space on the frontage of Nanigaya, which will create more parking spaces. Because yes. I understand that there's not enough parking space there as it is through you mr chairman that that's a perfect description of, of the discussions we've been having with municipal staff about how do we design those such one of the benefits not just putting in place a transitional form but designing those driveways you know limiting their width pairing the driveways then ensures that we can retain some amount of on-street parking so your your submission is is, is very okay. well taken it's something we've already been discussing with staff and we'll okay. address and the that. design of the houses would be similar to what's in the neighborhood um, that keeping? is that is intent. We've not sought any any modifications to that residential zone, um, other than specifics with regards to to its lot widths. Um, to okay. recognize what we're proposing. Uh, and I apologize. I do have one more question. Where is the garbage collection for the condominium corporation? So the. The development is designed on the basis of, again, through Mr. Chairman, the design is, is predicated on the basis of private collection. It, it will be a condominium. They will retain a property manager and they will retain private garbage collection services. Um, there are centralized garbage collection points. We intend to use what's called the MOLOC system, which is becoming very popular. It, it, it's been proven to be um, a very effective, clean, and attractive method of, of collecting garbage. So. It, it's private collection, it's not it'd municipal be, collection. It'd be more effective if there's more than one contractor that could actually provide it. When one contractor can only provide it, the condominium is stuck wherever that bill might be, but okay, uh, and that's fine. And so the intent then is long-term is your, these lots are gonna be severed off the property and, and sold off individually, right? Yes, the through you, Mr. Chairman, the intent will be dormitory home, we'll either create them through the plan of condominium, we'll create the block, we'll do part lot control. We have that ability because this is a block and a registered plan. Um, Don Victoria Home will retain them for the immediate future. They will do the sales. They will do the house designs and the marketing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Mr. Webb, thank you very much for that presentation. We don't have any other questions for you, but uh, there may be some at the end. So now we'll move to planning staff. I believe uh, Jeff Medeiros, you're going to be presenting on this on behalf of the planning department. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Medeiros. I'm a senior planner with, with the planning department at the city. And I'm here before you this afternoon to uh, present the staff recommendation report for PZ 2020, or sorry, dash 2020. Um, and that is for the property that's misly known as 12 Fisher Street. So this is a, uh, a zoning bylaw amendment or, or zone change uh, and I'll go to a bit more specifics as to what that constitutes as. The end result is to facilitate the creation of, of or the development of 104 residential units, and they vary between six singles, 86 stacked towns, and then 12 uh, block townhomes. 
as it relates to the site, it is vacant. Uh, it was part of a, or is part of a plan of form, plan of subdivision. And I'll speak to that uh, further along in the presentation. Um, for the most part, very limited uh, vegetation on site. Property has frontage on three streets, as the applicant has indicated, Nightingale Drive, uh, Scheller Lane, and Fisher Street. Um, similar to what the applicant has said as well, this is very much what I'm gonna call a, a complete community, at least one that's in transition. A mix of residential uses, singles, semis, townhouses. There's an apartment building that's currently under construction right next door. Um, there's commercial uses. There's public service facilities, schools, parks. There's a planned recreational facility. Very much a, a neighborhood in transition and, and very much a neighborhood that is, is walkable. Um, and similarly, too, there is a multi-use trail that uh, fronts the subject site along Scheller Lane. So I'm not going to go into too much details about the development proposal, sorry, uh, just a general idea of where the different uses are, the six singles, uh, the stacked towns, um, primarily about two thirds of the property, and then the two blocks of traditional block townhouses are towards the northern limits of the property. Central amenity area along the southern limits, right adjacent to Scheller Lane, and then there is a pedestrian connection through the site to Fisher Street. And access uh, is planned, or as originally planned, is, is to uh, Nightingale Drive. As it relates to the official plan, uh, the provincial policy, the proposal is consistent with the growth plan PPS, the official plan. Property is now designated in, as residential in the city's official plan. Uh, this application came in back in 2020, and initially an official plan amendment was submitted to the city. That particular amendment was to allow specifically for the six singles. So as the applicant has indicated, the property was designated residential medium density in the previous official plan. Um, and as a result of the new official plan and through the review of the applications, it's been determined that an official plan amendment is no longer required. The townhouses are a low rise building as defined in the bylaw and as such they're permitted in the current uh, official plan uh, designation on the property. Once again, a bit more context. This was a plan or a site that was part of a plan, a subdivision that was draft approved back in 2005. The property was rezoned then, it was redesignated then. It was always envisioned that this property would be uh, developed for uh, medium density residential uses, specifically for townhouses. Uh, just to put everyone's attention back to the screen, there is a block, block 88 is a one foot reserve, 0 0.3 meters. That was placed along the front of the Scheller Lane. There's typically a few reasons why reserves are placed on properties, but in this particular case, it's, it's very evident it was intended to prevent access to Scheller Lane. And so it was always envisioned that this site would be accessed through Nightingale Drive, similar to some of the abutting properties and, it, and was planned as such as part of the uh, Dobney Forest Estates plan of subdivision. From the zoning uh, side of things, the property is zoned R4A. It's got a site-specific R1, uh, or sorry, um, it, it does have an R4A zone. Um, the property is proposed uh, to be rezoned in two separate zones. One is actually a, a down zone, if I would call it that, uh, which is to go to an R1C-21. That is to facilitate the six singles. And then there is a, a site-specific uh, R4A Dash 81 zone that's proposed, and that is to recognize the townhouse complex uh, at the, the, I guess, for the balance of the property. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more specifically to all the site specific provisions. So uh, the R1C zone 20 or R1C dash 21 zone is going to is proposed to apply specifically to the six singles. This zone is very common. Um, there's a few examples of it that have been approved by, by this council in the past, the Lozani subdivision and some of the Winfield West uh, plans of subdivision. From uh, staff's professional opinion, uh, there are no concerns with the request for uh, the site-specific R1C-21 zone and, and staff are in support of that uh, request. Okay, 
So this is an irregular shape property and very much so the zoning permissions can have some variations in terms of how they're applied. And so in this particular case, the, the front yard is determined to be Nightingale Drive. And so the site-specific bylaw is, is used in such a way that it's to recognize a, a number of setbacks. Um, I'm not going to go through each individual one. These are the general locations of each one. Just one in particular to point out the Westley rear yard, 3.5 was illustrated in the staff reports. Actually, in fact, 3.05 meters of a marginal uh, reduction. Planning staff are in support of these requested uh, zoning provisions as noted in the staff report. And then in addition to that, there are some site-specific provisions. And just to kind of go through, highlight them, stack townhouses is one of them. Stack townhouses are defined in the zoning bylaw, but they're not permitted as of right in any zone in the city. So typically when an application comes before a committee or, or council, typically a zoning amendment is required in order to establish them. There has been a, a few projects in the past where um, the city has approved uh, stack townhouse uh, uh, that built form. Uh, staff are in support of that particular request and for this particular site. There are also some other site-specific provisions requested for lot area, gross floor area, amenity space, uh, parking space requirement, and the parking space location. Staff uh, don't have any concerns and are in support of the requested site-specific provisions as noted in the staff report. Just to kind of echo uh, a few comments that came through the staff's presentation, the amenity space, that is more of a clarification of where that space constitutes in the zoning bylaw. So that's more of a, a modification to what constitutes as amenity space. One thing in particular that staff are recommending is limiting amenity space along Scheller Lane. So what that would basically mean is that there wouldn't be uh, what I'm going to call enclosure of, of fences and, and, and detached accessory structures. And that's a, a site-specific recommendation. And then lastly is the parking requirements. So similar to as what the applicant indicated, the, the zoning bylaw in Brantford is from 1990. One, it doesn't recognize stacked townhouses, but it doesn't actually allow for tandem parking. The development is providing in excess of what would be required at, at a rate of 1.5 spaces. However, the bylaw does not recognize 16 of those spaces, which is why a site-specific exception is being requested at 1.35 spaces per unit. And staff are in support of that uh, uh, that request for um, a marginal reduction in the parking requirement. So through the uh, public process, the applications came in back in 2020. There's been uh, quite a bit of, of uh, public input throughout uh, the development process. Um, a number of emails and letters are appended to the staff report, and, the, and they're they're attached uh, for your for your viewing. And there was also a petition that was received by the city um, back at that time as well. There are some common themes and concerns that have been expressed by uh, residents uh, and members of the public with the site. A lot of them, ha for the most part, have to do with some of the issues with respect to traffic, uh, parking, um, compatibility. Safety, there are some general themes that have been uh, expressed through the commentary. On the parking side of things, as I said before, the, the site actually is in fact providing an excess of what would normally be required, although the bylaw doesn't recognize the 16 spaces. Um, I don't think the applicant had indicated this, but a previous concept plan that was submitted to the city had slightly less parking spaces. They actually increased the number uh, through the most recent plan to the city. So they did up their parking count to bring it closer in conformity with what the zoning bylaw requires at 1.5 spaces. And then from the traffic um, side of things, as, I, as the uh, agent's consultant has indicated, there's, there's no significant traffic concerns or there wasn't any significant traffic concerns identified to the, uh, in the various reports that have been submitted to the city to date. Um, there were some concerns and there has been some concerns expressed by members of the public uh, with respect to safety on, on the local streets. Um, you know, from, from staff's perspective, it's, it's a hard thing to quantify. There's, there's no real hard data that would indicate that a new development such as this would actually create a, a greater incident of, of safety with respect to, to collisions potentially on the road. So from, from that perspective, uh, planning staff don't have any concerns with respect to uh, the traffic analysis that has been completed to date. Uh, just a few other components to archeology. span There was a phase one and two submit to the city as part of the rezoning. 
Uh, that report would require it to be submitted to the ministry, and that's typically a condition at site plan, and as such, it would be a matter that would be dealt with at the site plan stage. And then lastly, compatibility and urban design. Um, Stack townhouse, as I said, very much a built form that we're starting to see in the city. This very much lines up with the development that is that is occurring today in West Brant. Um, staff are in support of this. This is a, a, a design that you know, brings the buildings closer to the street, minimizes some of the impacts of the neighboring properties. And as such, the zoning bylaw amendment in this situation is intended to really maintain that urban design, uh, reduce setbacks along Shellard Lane, holding the development to a specific setback from the neighboring properties on Fisher Street, um, while also recognizing that the fact that there's singles proposed, and that's to help with that sort of transition with uh, the built form of housing along Nightingale Drive. And, and from staff's perspective, we feel that it is a, a, a design that does meet a lot of the urban design objectives uh, that the city has in its official plan and urban design manual. And lastly, this is uh, you know a very a topic of discussion that I know is of particular interest. Um, it's been a topic of discussion that, that has come through the, the planning process as a result of uh, feedback through the public. When the application was initially submitted to the city, this concept was not being proposed. Through discussions with staff, uh, the ward councillors and members of the public, the applicant has submitted a, or had submitted a, a modified site plan earlier this year, which now includes this concept, which is a write-in, uh, write-out access only to, um, uh, to Sheller Lane, while still maintaining a, a pedestrian connection to Fisher Street, as well as the, the primary access to the site, which would be a Nightingale Drive. Um, I, I just want to say that we, you know, we we hear the members of the public loud and clear, and we can really appreciate where where individuals and folks are coming from. But from a planning perspective and from staff's perspective, we are not in support of the concept specifically as it relates to the proposed access to Shellert Lane. And I'll I'll try to explain some of that, and, and, and most of the analysis is in the staff report. But as I said before, this site was part of a plan of subdivision. It was never envisioned that there would be access to Shellard Lane. Shellard Lane is an arterial road. There's a median. That, that road classification is intended to, to move people from point A to point B with limited individual accesses to private property. And, and that is really how it functions today, that there are a few instances where there are, has been accesses granted, but for the most part, Shellard Lane is a controlled access way, similar to uh, Wayne Gretzky Parkway. This uh, particular subdivision came to the city at a time uh, in an old official plan. And back in, in the old official plan, there was something called the West of Conklin Secondary Plan. And there were design guidelines adopted at that time too. And that particular plan was, was, very, was very clear. It was highly discouraged that any sort of accesses would be uh, proposed to private property uh, for, for individual developments in a scenario like this. And then lastly, functionality. And what I mean by functionality is how this access is being proposed today. It's an access onto private property that essentially provides a right in, right out only access. And there might be added benefits in a scenario where perhaps individuals are coming from city hall and going to their homes at the end of the evening this access would benefit those sort of situations. But in situations where perhaps individuals are, are leaving the property and, and they're coming to work at City Hall, um, if, if they turn right onto Sheller Lane in a situation like this, they're still gonna have to meander right through the subdivision. They're either gonna be turning right on McGinnis Drive or they're gonna be turning left on Powell Road or they're gonna be doing U-turns. And from those situations, that is not something that planning or, or development services staff want to uh, encourage by any means. Um, there, there's some added risks obviously involved with that. I mean, there's, there's the potential for safety. Um, so safety for individuals living in the condo. And, and what I mean by that is, is that people in the subdivision could be using this as a bypass, right? Might be a quick way to get to someone's home that lives on Fisher Drive or on Nightingale Drive. So coming onto private property to go back on the public property. Um, there's also the safety concern that there's a multi-use trail in front of this site. There's the risk that there could be potential collisions with pedestrians or pedestrians on, on site. So uh, from that basis, uh, staff are, are, are not, as I said, in, in support 
of the private access uh, situation from a functional standpoint. Um, as noted in the staff report, um, and, and as noted by the, the transportation consultant, that access is not needed. This, this site, uh, or the, the current road network can handle the volume of traffic from this development. There wouldn't really be any added benefit by, by facilitating this access to the property. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that planning staff appreciate the, the comments that have been received to date from, uh, from members of the public, but uh, staff do not support uh, the access as, as shown on this plan. Um, and, and really as such uh, are, are in support of, of the zoning amendment, um, but are in support of the zoning amendment on the basis of the, the original concept, which uh, eliminated the access uh, or did not have an access to Sheller Lane. Um, I, just, just I guess in conclusion with that, I know we're talking about accesses, but it's not really something that's normally dealt with at the zoning stage, but uh, it is something that has come up through the public process. And I, I just wanna make it clear as to why I'm, I'm focusing on, on the access discussion in this particular case. It is outside the realm of zoning. However, we do recognize the fact that it is of, of public interest in this particular case. With respect to the number of units that would be required for a situation if in fact the developer was proposing singles, a development of this nature would warrant uh, almost double the amount of land if 98 uh, singles were proposed in total uh, versus the proposed 98 townhouses that are proposed. This calculation excludes the singles, um, but I just want to highlight the fact that a situation, in the event that uh, singles were proposed for this development, there would be a, a, a much larger mass of land that would be required in order to facilitate uh, development of these lands. So in conclusion, the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy growth plan, official plan, the townhouses and the singles are considered compatible. They're very much consistent with what's already there in the neighborhood. Um, they do provide much needed additional housing. That's obviously something that's of interest to the city, to the province and, and very much entrenched in the city's policies. And staff are recommending approval, um, but just keep in mind that staff's uh, recommendation is contingent based on the original plan. And that's the plan without the access to Shellard Lane. Um, and I just wanna make that, uh, make that very clear. One item of note too, and, and just to provide a bit of clarification, um, the applicant had indicated that there's an amended forthcoming, which I'm, I'm, I know committee's aware of that. That amendment is coming from this committee, not something that's coming from, from staff. As, as I've made myself very clear in this presentation, we're not in support of the proposed access, but are recommending approval of the subject zoning by amendment. So with that, I would be more than happy to answer any questions or comments. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff, we have several already. Councillor Lester first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to Jeff. Jeff, do we have any uh, ability to prohibit um, converting a, uh, a structured garage into living space, and and to main you know uh, maintain the the, uh, the ability to park a car in that space? Through through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so something of that nature would require a building permit. So typically if a, a permit submission was submitted to the city, we'd have to look at the minimum zoning requirements. The proposed zoning for this is very specific in the sense that it's holding them to a specific parking requirement. So if there are any deficiencies on the zoning side of things, uh, something of that nature would require an amendment to the bylaw, which could come back to this committee or could be through the committee of adjustment. Okay, I, I guess my concern is, um, I, I don't think it's a well-kept secret that most garages get turned into uh, living space and the intended use uh, is never achieved and hence we have parking problems. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's a way to ensure that, that things that are built for a certain purpose are used for that purpose and not some other purpose. And I think I hear you saying, yes, we do have that ability. We, we, yes, we definitely do. Um, the parking requirement is very specific. It's actually a, at a specific rate. It's, it's, not a, it's at 1.35 spaces per unit. So in the event that you know, parking would be potentially removed, legal parking spaces, then there would be requirements to, for an applicant to further amend the bylaw. 
Okay, thank you. Councillor Vanderstel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jeff, for your clear, concise <laughs> presentation on the topic. Um, this this is strangely reminiscent of uh, Councillor Schles's idea of trying to put ten pounds of sugar in a five pound bag, and it's 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 frustrating for the neighborhood. Um, I, I wouldn't ask you to uh, nail down any numbers, and I know it's a hypothetical question, but it's a three-point question. If 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 uh, committee members decided that this isn't in the best interest of the neighborhood, uh, following along the same lines that happened at Grand River Ave, um, and we voted this we voted this down categorically because it was it's just too too intense and too much, um, it would come at a cost, as I understand it, to the city to go through the tribunal uh, process. It would come at a cost to Don Victoria Homes, and it would take a certain amount of time. So would would you or perhaps anybody in the room want to take a stab at how long it would take and how much money it would take? Through the chair, Heidi DeVries, general manager, people, legislative services and planning, which includes the legal department. Um, that all depends on the basically what we would be looking at if this council does not um, approve of a, of a recommendation of its staff with respect to an expert matter like this, we would be in a position to hire outside uh, planning consultants to support the decision of council, which can run anywhere. It depends on how long the hearing would be, but that's upwards of $10,000 typically. Um, we are depending on the nature of the uh, appeal in the position to have to hire external legal counsel, which tend to be a little bit higher than planning counsel these days. Um, the OLT, as it's now called, um, I understand has a significant backlog. So you'd be looking at, I would say, upwards of six months at least um, for some of the preliminary matters that we're, we're seeing before the OLT. So there would be delays to development. We know that we have targets to meet as well in the city of Brantford. Um, so uh, it, it's not a very accurate or precise, I should say, ballpark, but I can say it does cause delays. And at the same time that uh, this hearing and the decision is in the, the hands of this, uh, this body, um, and if that was the case, then we would make those arrangements through our city solicitor and a report would be forthcoming to council. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Council, council Martin. Thank you, Jeff. The, there's two blocks to the Southwest that are between Nightingale and Shellard. What's planned for those blocks? They're, they're larger than single family homes. Through you, Mr. Mayor, as of today, I'm, I'm not aware of any development applications for those lots. Um, if we were to pull up the plan of subdivision again, I believe those lots were actually omitted from the plan, so they were existing homes. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm uncertain if there's any plans for those. We haven't received any formal Planning Act applications to answer your question. Okay, so and if something does come in for that, would you insist that their access be off Nightingale instead of Shellard? So through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, those lots already, the ones that do have existing homes do have existing accesses to Shellard Lane. Uh, through a development application, staff would most likely encourage that they would develop the site in such a way that they would utilize the existing road network um, through the plan of subdivision at the rear, but without seeing a concept plan, it's it's difficult to suggest how those lots are going to be developed potentially. Okay, and uh, could you guess how many townhouses would fit on uh, those two uh, larger blocks? It's a good question. I, Very rough guess. I, I'm guessing at least one, perhaps. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'd have to look at the zoning, but there would be a possibility that they might have to go through a zoning exercise as well. Okay, thank you. Councilor Carpenter. Oh, thank you, uh, Jeff. Maybe uh, other staff will have to answer this question. Uh, if, if we um, approve this, are we approving the roadways? Uh, we're not approving the right in, right out. We, be, we, we would be approving the roadway off of Nightingale, or is that something that can be adjusted through site plan at any time or by resolution? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So the, the application before committee this evening is specifically for zoning and bylaw amendment, which is the what I'm going to call the design concept. So the setbacks, the built form, those sort of things. Typically, accesses are established through and approved through site plan control. Um, so at that stage, we look at 
you know, line of sight and making sure that it's a safe access. However, uh, committee does have the ability to, through perhaps a resolution or, or a revision through to the recommendation to grant and direct staff to allow for access to perhaps Sheller Lane as an example. And, and that's what I'm thinking of. I mean, um, to me, uh, there are a number of accesses off of Sheller Lane. In fact, I'm thinking about Linden Road and Ward, the Fourth Ward. We've given, we're going to grant a whole subdivision access of a linen road at a curve uh, because there isn't any other access. Um, I know that's coming. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering why this road is, and we compared it to, I think you compared, we compared it to uh, Wayne Gretzky Parkway, which is 70 kilometers an hour. Um, just want to know, uh, so we could, the, if the ward councils want to bring forward a resolution or amendment tonight, today, uh, we could say that we want a, a right in, we want a full access off of Shelters Lane at the expense of the developer, which would remove the interior um, um, island so they could turn right and turn left. And we would close the access of a Nightingale to make full access off of Shelters Lane to protect the integrity of the neighborhood. And because uh, this seems to be, we're just holds, we're holding steadfast to not, not giving an access off of Shelters Lane. How do we do that? So uh, three, Mr. Mayor, so similar to uh, my last comment, it, it would be through a uh, staff would have to be directed to to explore that if, if that's the the desire of, of committee and, and uh, the rest of the committee members. Would, would that have to be done here or could, could the, the ward councils bring that further at a further date? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's that's a good question. I mean, we have a recommendation before the committee to date. And once again, it's specific to the zoning bylaw amendment. I mean, that perhaps could be something that could be explored down the road. but. However, you know, we're in, we're in an open public forum as it stands today. And, you know, if, if committee does want to proceed on that basis, they have the ability to do so today. Okay, because that's the only way I'm going to support the application. Thank you. Councilor McCreary. Jeff, as I look at the air photo of the neighborhood um, on Google Maps, there appears to be the creation of an intersection there already for road access into this property. Um, I don't know if you, if you can identify that. Through you, Mr. Mayor, from what street, Nightingale Drive specifically? Because I access from Shellard's Lane, there's already an intersection created there. It's curbed and paved back about maybe 10 feet from the road. So, so through, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm not aware of there being, I'm, I'm looking at the air photos to speak right now, and I'm not aware of there being any accesses. There are some accesses for um, the existing single to the west. There is a planned uh, municipal uh, walkway to the west, which would provide a connection from Nightingale Drive to Sheller Lane, but there is already an existing access for the condo site, and that might be the one that you're referring to, which is the um, apartment building next door to the east of the site. So that was an existing access. No, let me, let me draw your attention to the air photo map uh, of this site. Uh, and there is, a, there is a Shellard's Lane access road stub that's already there. So through you, Mr. Mayor, perhaps it may be about a culvert. There is a large culvert that goes- No, it's not. It's, a, it's, a, it's an intersection. It's an intersection. It's an intersection, okay? It's curbed and paved back about eight or 10 feet by the look of it. Yeah. So obviously, when we built the roadway, um, there was a, there was it looks to be a desire to have something entering that site from there. Uh, through the chair, Gary Peaver, manager of development engineering. Uh, to the chair, to Councillor McCreary, there is no paved apron uh, or driveway to this site off of Shellard Lane. The, the paved portion that you might be seeing on the overhead is for a neighboring property. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Jeff, I got a couple of questions for you. <clears throat> Similar to a question I had for you Tuesday night regarding your use of land slide. Um, just in simple terms, if you were developing the same number of units using the smallest single family lot, how much additional land in terms of multiple? Tuesday night was three times, but would it be here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, through you, uh, uh, Mayor Davis, um, 
approximately just over a hectare of land would be required if the site were to be developed strictly for singles. Um, keep in mind that that doesn't take into account any public roadway, like internal roadways that'd be required, amenity features, things of that nature. And so that extra hectare translates to about just shy of three acres would be required if the site was developed fully for singles. So to do the same number of units on a single family concept would require three additional acres. Is that correct? Correct. And how many acres is this site? So the, the portion specifically for the towns is 1.48 hectares, which is 3.61 acres. Okay. All right. Um, on the issue of the access to this development <clears throat> off of Shellard Lane, the, do I understand the applicant is willing to do what I would call a right in, right out at their cost? So three, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that is my understanding. I mean, the, the concept that was proposed and, and shown on the plan is the latest revision of the site plan, which was submitted by the applicant as a, as a means to attempt to address public, public input as well as comments they'd received from the city. Okay. So what would it take to do right in, but right and left out? I think that was described as option three in your report. So a, a right in and left out. And when you mean left out, is that to go across the median, across the median. So that, east. I mean, that would require much more significant work. There's, there's a large median in place. Um, most likely would require controlled access with, with lights. Um, so that's a much more, I would say a larger project um, versus a, a right in right out, which, you know, simply would be some some grading and, and asphalting and, and curbing. All right, and what concerns of NAD staff have with a right in and a left out? So one's cost, I assume. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I think, well, I know from, from staff's uh, um, from staff's perspective, as, as I had indicated in my presentation, it would be the same position. It's it, it goes beyond the scope of what this site was intended to be developed. It was always intended to be developed through the Nightingale uh, roadway um, in terms of access. So um, as I said before, I mean, staff are in support of the zoning amendment, but from our uh, perspective, um, you know, we would, we would consider the fact that the, that would probably not be something we would be in support of. However, um, yeah. I think well, you're, the, you're giving me the planner's perspective. Yes, I'm going to. What about the engineer? I'm going to defer that to one of my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to yourself, uh, there there are concerns about a full movement access, as you're referring to for this site. Uh, one of it would be the pro close proximity to the existing intersections that are already on Shellard Lane. Uh, uh, secondly, there is some significant cost to removing that median potential street lighting conduit and storm sewers work that would be required to open up that access. Uh, Shellard Lane, when it went through the EA, looked at the existing driveways along Shellard and gave full access to those as they were existing. Uh, however, uh, many of the sites were given either only a right in, right out uh, for future developments. Uh, so there are, there are some concerns from a costing from an engineering standpoint and, and also a safety standpoint due to the close proximity to the adjacent uh, intersections. Okay. Um, not seeing any other questions. Thank you very much, John. So we're now at the stage of the public hearing where we open the floor to members of the public to speak to this item. Uh, we have two registered virtual members of the public who have asked to participate. So we'll go to them first. And then I'll ask if there's anyone present here today in the chamber that would like to speak to it. So first let's go to, I believe it's a Mr. Craig Shaw. He's joined us virtually. Um, so if you could please bring Mr. Shaw forward out of the virtual waiting room. Mr. Shaw, if you're listening, could you please start your video? Yep. 
Sorry about that. Yeah, there you are. Okay, so if you could please uh, state your name, your address, and then give us your comments. My name is Craig Shaw, and I live at 26 Yarrington Drive in Brantford. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the the um, the issue that we have, uh, we we had discussed this as a as a community. Um, I'm going to say a little over a year, a year and a half ago. And uh, we had, did have community a lot of community involvement, and we actually had the councillor involvement as well at the time. <clears throat> and it was with, with regards to traffic. And I know in listening to all the, the talks here as well, that traffic is, is obviously top of the line for, for this particular development. And the concern we have is, is the study that was done. Uh, just, it seems a little weak to me as far as how many cars are actually going to go through this, this area. In myself, I mean, I have, I have three cars in my household. And the majority of the people on this uh, on this road on Yarrington and on McGinnis and on Fisher and on uh, Nightingale have three, sometimes four cars per household. Uh, if we're looking at 56 cars in the morning and 65 at night, I think that's that's not even close. Uh, I would say that we probably have more than that now uh, with the current people that are actually in the house. Now I haven't actually gone out and counted. But I do go and I do sit and I do walk around the community and I see the kind of cars that we have and how many cars we have in the in the area. And I just don't think that's that's going to happen. Now, we were part of the uh, community that suggested putting something out onto Sheltered Lane, which I believe is is the best way to do things. And in listening to some of the comments with the mayor and others, I think that's definitely the best way to go about it, whether it be a, an expense or not. It would definitely relieve a lot of the congestion on the internals of the uh, of the community. Um, we also looked at the potential of, of multiple uh, people or multiple um, families in in houses, and I know the types of communities that we have currently. And and in walking in the community, we also have uh, multiple families in each dwelling. So I don't know if that's been considered, uh, but in mortgages mortgage rates going up and the cost of houses going up as well this seems to be a reality for a lot of people so i don't know if this has been considered and of course for the amount of cars and traffic this would can would congest into nightingale is concerning <clears throat> uh, there was also talk about the uh the access onto the sheltered lane being right in right out uh, i know that there was access given to a new facility that's on conklin and sheltered and if we can explain why that one was actually granted uh, and this one won't be or wouldn't be granted is, is a question of mine. Anything else, Mr. Shaw? That's all I have. Okay, we may have some questions for you from the councillors. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. So uh, we'll start uh, Councillor Vanderstelt, then Councillor Martin, then Councillor Kirby. Uh, thank you for taking uh, time out of your day. It, it looks like you might even be at work right now, attending a meeting oh, yeah. publicly. That's great. Um, okay, so you're predominantly your concerns are with the amount of traffic and the, the parking um, as it will affect the rest of the neighborhood. Um, do, you, um, do you have a, a large um, difficulty accepting the, the density, considering that they have reduced the density by about 10%, or is that not on your radar? No, we have a definite concern with the density of traffic. As I said, you're looking at 104 units. If you do the math, that the average household has two cars per, you have at least two workers in every house, myself and my wife both work. And I know in talking with members of the community, that is the case for 95% of the people in the community. So you have two, at least two cars going out plus kids and whether there be any other family members living with them as well. So you're like three to four cars per house. We've only, we've only said that there's gonna be 56 or 65 cars going out in the morning and the afternoon. You're probably talking at least triple that. Right, and, and since this began, have you come across any of your neighbors? I mean, you, you must have been there for quite some time now. Have you come across any of your neighbors who are, um, who are moving out knowing that this development is going to happen? Yeah, so we've been at the we've been here for eight years. We moved in in 2014, and when we originally moved in, we were discussed. Uh, we looked at that open lot, and we were told by the the actual developer of our community that that wasn't going to be developed for a heck of a long time, if at all. And if anything, it was likely going to go commercial. 
That being said, uh, in talking with some of the community members that we have around us, <clears throat> there's no talks about people specifically moving, but I know it has come across our bench uh, of talk, my wife and I, about moving out of the community because of this, because of the amount of traffic that's going to be created. Okay, and you were one of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were there were there 180 signatures? You, you were one of those signatures, correct? I was, yes, I was. Okay, all right, thank you very much. No problem. Councillor Martin, you're next. Thank you, just a quick question. You indicated that uh, you, your family has three vehicles. Yep. Uh, how many parking spots do you have on your property? I have four, two on my driveway and two in my garage. Okay, and is that typical of your neighborhood or? Do very, very typical. Have... Typical okay. and uh, what I see on mostly on uh, McGinnis especially <clears throat> is most families have two in their driveway. Uh, they don't use their garage at all because it's full of stuff, which tends to happen. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but my garage tends to get full of stuff as well. And most everybody parks on the street. My house especially, I, my house resides right beside McGinnis essentially, if you look at it on the map. And uh, that area outside my house is typically full of cars already. And that's just from houses from McGinnis uh, or anybody else on our street. Uh, we tend to be where it gets all full of cars. So I'm not welcome. On street parking is already a problem in your area. It is. And it's a concern, you know, I have kids and there's lots of little kids in the community as well, which is one of the reasons why we put the petition together. Uh, and I do worry about these kids out on the street playing basketball or doing whatever else they're going to do. Understanding it's a street and it's supposed to be used for cars, but that tends to happen in a, in a young community. <laughs> and uh, you're going to have people that are rocketing through there at 50 or 60 kilometers an hour or even higher. Uh, you know, there's a potential, there is a safety potential. And that was the reason why we brought up the safety concerns. Um, you also have an intersection at McGinnis and Yarrington that's a, uh, uh, McGinnis is a straight through and, McGin and Yarrington is a stop sign. Uh, I already have some issues sometimes getting out on there and uh, I have a police friend that's right across the street from me as well that's almost been collided with there as well in the current state with how fast people go down uh, McGinnis. So adding more traffic to that is definitely going to be a safety concern. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carpenter. Hey, Mr. Mayor. Um, Craig, thanks for coming. Um, I appreciate you speaking up on behalf of your neighborhood and working with your neighborhood and your community. Uh, do you have any objections if the access was closed off of uh, Nightingale and uh, full access was granted to Shutter's Lane for this development? And how do you feel about the six single lots going on Nightingale instead of townhouses? So if the access was a left in, left out or right out or whatever they're going to put on Shutter Lane and the one on Nightingale was shut off, I would fully support it. And as a community, I believe we're all the same in the same boat with that. As far as the six lots go, it wouldn't make much of a difference uh, because you're talking about six small residential areas uh, or um, units. The only concern I do have is there are some open spots. And I think I heard the mayor or somebody was talking about the, um, the, un, uh, the open lots that are beside the, the current, uh, current lot here now. <clears throat> and... I know that there's electrical posts coming out of the ground for these particular ones. And it does look like it would be townhouses at some point. And if they're built into uh, Nightingale, that could potentially be an issue. And I'm sure I'd be against that as well. Uh, but as far as the six single dwellings, I really don't have too much of an issue in that. And neither does the community. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Councillor Schlutz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Craig, for coming. Uh, very similar to, to uh, Councillor Carpenter's question. If, if if it was still left open on uh, Nightingale, but there was a right in, right out on uh, on Shellards, would that make this uh, more appealing to you in your community? It certainly makes it more appealing. I understand some of the some of the reservations behind it, uh, being the fact that there could be a drive through and uh, you know into the community that sort of thing from a private access, uh, but I would feel much better with having something like that. Uh, be available to the people that are there. And I actually think that the people that would be living there would be, uh, would be happy with that as well, because going onto an internal street, especially ones that are as cluttered as ours at times, uh, it can be awful daunting getting through there, especially when you have how many people going through there every day. Okay. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, Mr. Shaw, those questions. Uh, again, thank you very much for uh, attending virtually this afternoon to uh, give us uh, your concerns and thoughts on those. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. All right. All right, we have a, a second delegate that's registered to attend virtually. That's Jonathan Smith. So if we could bring Jonathan Smith from the virtual waiting room. Okay, Mr. Smith, if you could just turn on your video, please. And your microphone. There it is. Can you hear me? Yeah, so, so Mr. Smith, uh, thanks very much for coming out this afternoon. If you could state, please, uh, your full name, your address, and then you can go ahead and uh, give us your presentation. Yes, Jonathan Smith, and uh, we're, uh, my wife and I are at 8 Fisher Street. Um, just with regards to, I uh, had a, a question for the developer, uh, with regards to, um, we're, we back on to the, uh, the proposed development site where block one and block two are. Uh, for the townhomes, and uh, our, our concern too is the the uh, you know there is an existing uh, fence line at the back. Um, there's also uh, you know some good healthy trees there along the the back edge as well. So we just wanted to know from the developer, um, you know, with the would, would would they be amiable to keeping these trees um, so that they wouldn't have to be uh, removed when the site was put in. All right, there is, uh, Mr. Smith, an opportunity that once the public input has been obtained for the uh, proponent to come forward again and answer any questions that come up through this part of the meeting. So certainly we'll make sure we ask that question. Do, is there anything else you'd like to say or any other questions you have? Um, just, just the, you know, it, it's, it's something that's, that's been reiterated by others, other residents. You know, we already have a lot of congestion on either side of the road on Fisher, uh, such that, you know, especially in the wintertime where the plows can't can get through because there's parking on either side. Uh, and it's that's the front. And, and even when I'm backing my truck out of out of our driveway, um, you, you know, there's there's you know, there's always the worry of, of, of hitting someone on the other side of the street. So many cars, the density and the parking. So. Uh, it, that's, um, you know, I, I with resident, uh, the, the previous resident from Yarrington, uh, uh, we would we would really be supportive of uh, of that in out uh, proposal if that could happen as well. Um, that actually does sound very encouraging if that could happen. Great. Well, we got a couple of other councillors that have some questions for you, Mr. Smith. Uh, starting with Councillor Vanderstel. Thank you for uh, for showing today uh, early in the day, Mr. Smith. Appreciate it very much. Uh, when you say you'd be in favor of the in out um, option, could could you say a little bit more about that? You're okay with the right in, right out, or you prefer something different? Well, it would alleviate uh, right in, right out off of so off of the off of Shellards. Is that what we're we're talking about? The entrance yeah. and exit. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, coming into that development, uh, going northbound, it would be an easy entrance in, um, on the egress of, if for the exit part, um, you know, it would only leave the option of a right-hand turn, uh, unless there was suitable amendments made to the, to the median if, you know, to, uh, to clear that for a southbound exit, um. So you, know, you, would take, I, you would take one option over the other, or you're just only recommending uh, the right in, left out. Um, I, I we would we would prefer just to alleviate the congestion and have it, uh, you know, completely self-contained. Um, as I say, you know, the previous resident mentioned uh, from Yarrington, just the amount of traffic, extra traffic it, it brings onto Nightingale and also to Fisher is. Uh, you know, it wasn't designed for this. It's a, you know, this is, uh, you know, especially uh, this this whole area and the uh, the high rise, you know, just south of that proposed development as well. It, it's just, 
it's not suitable for for the uh, for the community. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Smith, um, thank you very much. There are no further questions for you. Uh, we will be dealing with this uh, shortly. Uh, again, thank you very much for coming in virtually. Thank you. All right, so those are the uh, residents who came who registered to speak to this virtually. So we're now th throwing the floor open. If there's anybody present in the chamber, any member of the public that would like to speak to this matter, uh, now is your opportunity to come forward, ma'am. So if you can just please come forward to the delegates table. Uh, don't worry about it. So, so what you do is someone will help you with the microphones. So just like the people that came in virtually, we just ask you if you'd state your, your name, please, your address, and then you can give us Hi. your comments. My name is uh, Lynn Hunter. I live at 46 Nightingale Drive in Brantford. <laughs> and my husband's here <laughs> as my backup. Um, there's been so many things taught today about traffic. And uh, I put together a little note. Some of it I'm going to skip by because we've already talked about it, okay? But uh, I want to say good afternoon, Mayor Davis, and to the council women and men on the board. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, our, attend our attendance is down. And of course, that's because this is prime holiday time. And I understand you adjusting your, your time to get together today. So we appreciate that. Um, and also, there's a lot of people that are still working today. And most of them in our survey are young. We're the old people in the group, as they say. Okay. So anyways, we thank you for the opportunity to talk to you in regards to the proposed development that was noted in the public notice sent out to us via mail. As a community, we are very worried about how this complex will put more strain on what is already a problem and a concern for the safety and the families and children, especially. One weekend, the mayor and Rick Weaver, who is a past um, area man, <laughs> had said they would like to meet the people and suggested that we do a drone video of the streets around the areas that we were concerned of. And uh, that was awesome. Absolutely awesome. And as you could tell, you had a good time. Your daughter was the girl that did the drone video for us. So that was great. But putting the kids together, building signs to talk about what was really happening. And I'm sure you got the concern that was involved in that. Um, and uh, we, they were so happy to meet with you because they felt you cared. Okay, so that was very important. In 2020-21, we did a petition on a survey about this development in the area, and we pre uh, presented it to Rick and Ian, Van, uh, Jan Van de Stel, sorry. It was presented to the city. They were told that we had an excellent turnout on that area that was canvassed. In fact, there were numbers like 75% to 80% of the public. And that were very interested and concerned about what was happening. Um, we had no idea that was our ratio, but that was good. We were just so pleased. One of the changes that showed up on the second vision, uh, revision of the exit going out of Nightingale project, but noted that it is a one way heading west, all right, to the town. This leads to a concern that a lot of people are not heading west. They are heading to Hamilton or Toronto mostly. If they use this exit, you would find a lot of cars doing U-turns, which has been talked about before, okay? Which could also cause a lot of accidents in that area. We don't understand why a single home can have access for both directions to the survey. It would help. Hope you can explain because this is a very busy street and will become more so as the homes become finished. Shellard Lane is already becoming a speedway. Um, at night you can hear them going like crazy with the, mo the motorcycles and souped up cars. And 
a light would certainly show, slow that down and also help the children cross safely to schools because there are schools on both sides, one on our side and one across. A lot of people do not realize that Nightingale Drive is not a through street, it's a cul-de-sac. Nobody brought that up. <laughs> Nobody brought that up today. It's a cul-de-sac on both sides. And we rely on other streets to get out, okay, to Shellard Lane. For example, one of our routes is Nightingale to Fisher, Fisher to Sharksburg, then to Conklin, and then to Shellard. The other route we can take is Nightingale to Yarlington, McGinnis, and then Shellard. This on top of all these streets that we have to access to get out is creating a problem to begin with. Parking on this street are already at its maximum and we have provided pictures of the parking situation on file. We have a lot of issues that with cars parking on both sides of the road, we have made that street less wide with the result that only one car can pass at a time. So we have to wait. Concept site plan. Noting there is 117 spaces located at grade level to service 86 stacked down homes. They gave us the ratio of how many handicap parking. They said six for that whole complex. What I didn't see on it, and I may have missed it, is the fact there are no designated spots for visitor parking. So just out of research, what is the allotment spaces for visitors parking on this property? Okay. Example, Conklin Complex, there's a condominium complex, one level. They have 29 condos with garages and driveways. And they have a lot of 20 visitor spacings in that unit. This is a concern because there will be, where will the visitors park if there has nothing? So I just like to know what the ratio of parking. So maybe that gentleman can come back and assist us with that question from Don. Um, also the average homeowner has two cars and that's been talked about two plus cars because there are a lot on our street. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> where will these cars go? Noting that if the stats are correct, there would be over 40 cars looking for a place to park in our area. Will they go to the Toronto Dominion Plaza that's there or the schools to park? I am sure they would not want that at all. So where would they go? Of course, the logical area is the surrounding streets, Nightingale, Fisher, Yarlington, Shirksburg, by walking through a walkway off of Fisher. We ask, is this the way to keep our community safe? The city has been documentation that the area residents do not want to have stacked townhomes. Interesting note that some locations in Ontario are not even looking at that kind of facility of stacked townhomes. The side of Shellard is mostly single family homes. Why would you want to start to change? Complete this side and single family homes or townhomes on the road of Nightingale. The volume would be better to handle and safer for our families. You've already discussed it in a way, asking questions to other people. Just west of this location, you're building 10,000 single homes, we've been told. Why not try investing in stacked townhomes on a street that isn't a cul-de-sac, okay? And test how that moves, how it goes. You might be surprised. <laughs> it could be good or it could be bad, but don't put it on a cul-de-sac, okay? If we move to eliminate the stacked townhomes only on this Nightingale property, it would definitely help omit the extra volume of cars. And maybe we could add a little park for the children to enjoy. When do we stop thinking of money and thinking about the safety of our community and our future? This is our home 
and I thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Hunter, but uh, we will have some questions for us and counselors. And uh, the question you asked about visitor parking, we can certainly ask the applicant when. Yeah, because it wasn't back. mentioned today, so I yeah. thought that's something to think about because you can't park. There's an opportunity for them to respond. I'm sure they will. Okay. So let's Thank see. Um, Councillor Vanderstel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Lynn. Hi. I'm glad you're here today. We've glad talked you, a few glad times. You can make it. No, I know. And I thank you for your advocacy on behalf of that entire group. Um, it's yes. uh, th this is a this is a tough one. It's a tough it one to is. swallow. It really is. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to envision, and it's it's hard to imagine the effects that it may have on a sleepy cul-de-sac. I, I didn't say sleepy cul-de-sac <laughs> yet, but there's two of them, and they're definitely sleepy. You're right. And they go nowhere. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, that being said, if if you had your choice of all the options that you may have heard today, either, uh, you know, either no access to Shellard or right in, right out Shellard or right in, left out Shellard with some sort of a intersection, what would be your preference and what would be the preference of your, the people that you represent as well in that area? We, on a whole, we are looking at exiting Shellard that would help our community our cul-de-sac, you know, it really would. And it's probably be safer. Um, I think I believe in our conversations in the past when we've had other meetings, it, it was expressed that this might be an option that could be looked at. Uh, but I think for children traveling too, you would think of the demographic of a stacked town home or townhouses, a lot of them will have children. <laughs> Why do they need to walk around out of Fisher, go up Shirksburg, go up <laughs> to go to school when he, all they have to do is walk out and go forward, you know, to the schools. Um, so I think that would be my best scenario. Um, stack homes, I think if you could try them in another area, that'd be really good, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's what everybody wants, not to have cars zooming around a cul-de-sac. Yeah, and, and that leads to my second question for you. Um, you you indicated that there's quite a bit of speeding that happens up and down that four lane stretch, uh, and that's problematic. Yes. Um, and is it your contention or the few, everyone who signed the position that the one of the best things that we could do in that location is to put signalized um, intersection in in order to slow that traffic down? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. All right. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for, for, for coming today. Thank you. Councillor Sicoli. Yes, thank you. Hi, Hi. Lynn. <laughs> I didn't see your light on, sorry. <laughs> I'm behind here somewhere. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming out. And Councillor Vanderstelt touched on a few things that I was going to ask you, but you had mentioned that you were surrounded by many young families. Yes, I love it. It's great. And I live in the area, so I'm gonna ask you a question that I already know the answer to, but. How many children would you say percentage of houses live on your street? That's a hard one. Just a ballpark. Do little ones or university too, including yeah, yeah. kids that would be out on the streets playing or walking to school? Would you say it's more than 60%? Yes. yes. Would you say it's more than 70%? Could be, yes. Say it's upwards of eighty percent of our neighborhoods. I, yeah, I'll would. go with that too because that's all a plus. <laughs> that you yeah. you make my point brilliantly. But, Thank you. But that's I really, all I had for you. Yeah, good. Thanks. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you, Councillor Schless. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for coming out, Lynn. Uh, as I look at the uh, at the diagram, the schematic of, of what's being proposed. To me, the uh, the walkway that exits the uh, the subject property out onto Fisher um, is really problematic. That, that that's inviting people to park on Fisher and walk in. Correct? It, would it not make sense to you that that uh, that that be stopped up so that people aren't parking there and walking through a walkway into where they want to ultimately be? I would I highly agree with you. In fact. My husband and I were talking that, why don't you sell off that property instead of letting it be a walkway and let the people that live beside it buy in to that, whatever you're gonna charge. 
but that's what we were thinking. But yeah, we were really concerned. Thank you for bringing that up. He's gone now. <laughs> Did it leave? Okay. No, it, it just seemed oh, logical looking looking at the map that uh, um, you're, you're inviting parking to take place on Fisher and, and other areas other than on the subject property by allowing that to be open. Okay, I, I just wanted to get your, your feelings on that, Lynn. I really appreciate your response. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's really, I think, don't have any other questions for you, but again, uh, uh, thank you very much for actually coming today and uh, speaking to this matter. It was my pleasure. <clears throat> and on behalf of the whole group that signed that petition, um, it is unfortunate that more couldn't be here, but um, I think this has done well and we appreciate all the work you've done. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask then if there is anyone else who is present uh, in the chamber today that would like to speak to this matter. Now is uh, your opportunity to come forward. Yes, I believe Mr. Hunter with that. Sir, if you would just state your Full name and your address, and then uh, continue your I am, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my name's Howard Hunter and 46 Nightingale. Just a couple of quick questions. Uh, concerning the walkway, if it provides a safe walkway for kids in the community to go back and forth to school with sidewalks and everything, not walking through a a parking lot, then I can see keeping it open. If not, then close it. And my other questions on the, on the parking for the complex, are they designated? Like if I live in unit 26, if I get a number on my parking spot that says 26 and another spot that says 26 on three days of the week, like it's my spot Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and somebody else's spot? Or how do you divide 1.35 or seven parking spots up? Or do you purchase an extra parking spot? Like that's my biggest concerns. We can, we can certainly ask that question. Uh, can you explain what your concern is about whether there be designated or non-designated. We'll ask, we'll ask the question of the applicant. So. If I've got, if I'm living there and I've got four cars and three of them only move once a week, I'm gonna take up three parking spots and I'm, I might have to lurk around until a parking spot's empty because if they're not designated, I'm putting my Mustang in one and putting my Corvette in the other one and I'm putting my Model A in the third one. And then the car I drive, the Volvo, I'm gonna park wherever the hell I can, probably over on Nightingale. You've got a lot of cars. Yeah. So anything else you wanna say before I throw the floor to questions for you? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. So we'll see if anybody would like to ask you a question. Saying no questions, thank you very much. Okay. And uh, we'll be sure to ask the applicant those two questions. So, uh, is there any any other member of the public that's present today in the chamber that would like to speak to this matter? If so, please come forward. So I've got to ask this three times. Uh, is there any other member of the public that's present in the chamber that would like to come forward to speak to this matter? Uh, now is your opportunity to do so. And I'll ask a third and final time, uh, I feel like I'm running an auction here. Is there anyone else present in the chamber that would like to speak either for or against this application? Would you please come forward? So I think that no one else is present wanting to come forward. So I'll call upon Mr. Mr. Webb. You have an opportunity to provide the proponent's response and any additional information required based on the questions we've heard. We've heard about visitor parking, designated parking, 
um, keeping the trees on the northerly boundary. I think those were at least three questions we heard. Um, thank you, Your Worship and members of the committee, and I'm pleased to assist with some follow-up. I, I think I have four key items there. The, the assignment of parking, the interface for the Fisher units, I think a complete misperception with respect to the intensity of this development, and lastly, the proposed modifications to the site access. So I'll, I'll deal with you know, the straightforward ones. There's you know, 149 parking spaces, which includes garage spaces, but the, the, the project is directed in the manner wherein each and every unit is assigned one parking space and one parking space only. And that means that the surplus are then set aside as visitor parking. With regards to Fisher Street and the interface with the rear lot lines, absolutely, that's, that's an issue that we can deal with at the site plan and it's, and it's, it's a collaborative issue. Um, you know, we would propose fencing along that rear lot line, but in any circumstance where there is existing fencing, we don't want to in interfere with people's fencing. So we would work with those homeowners to preserve it, not just their existing fencing, but also any existing vegetation. As part of a complete submission, we are required to submit to the city a tree preservation plan that studies all existing vegetation on the property. It's then evaluated in the context of the development. You know, what do we need to do in terms of installation of services? Um, you know, can those existing trees be preserved? It's about, if it's a boundary tree, then any removals obviously require the consent of that adjoining property owner. So my submission, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, we would work collaboratively with those property owners to you know, maintain existing vegetation for the purposes of screening and buffering. And any issues with respect to fencing, obviously it's a site plan issue, but we would again, work collaboratively with those people to you know, not disrupt what they may have, supplement, complement, and, and ensure that at the end of the day, there's appropriate screening and buffering between existing development and proposed development. I heard a lot of discussion with respect to the intensity of the development. And I think that there's a very real conflict between perceived impacts and real impacts. As part of our submissions, we've retained experts, traffic experts, um, traffic engineers. I mean, you heard Erica speak and we've, we've heard commentary with respect to perceived impacts on the roads. The roads are gonna to become too busy. Um, I'm a land use planner. We know a little bit about a lot of things. I rely on my experts, those traffic engineers to assist me to evaluate the impacts of this development. And you heard the submissions from our traffic engineer to say that this subdivision was designed in a manner that this block, albeit it's interior to the development, there was a very clear pattern and hierarchy of roads established with certain design standards in place to accommodate volumes of traffic, whether those be local streets, collector streets, or arterial roads. And the commentary that you heard from our engineer, Erica Braley, and not contradicted by the city's experts, is that the, the proposed loading as always intended by the subdivision approved all the way back in 2005. This is the way it was intended to design. Yet Nightingale, does have two cul-de-sacs, but Nightingale is effectively part of a street pattern that exfiltrates or infiltrates traffic into this development and onto those higher order roads. <coughs> Keep in mind as well, the size of these units. You, you'll, you will have seen as part of the site specific zoning amendment that the minimum unit size was taken down from 70 square meters to 60 square meters. 86 of the units that are proposed are stacked units. Now, Don Victoria Homes has built, they're building them at Park Road North and we've done them at 10 other projects. They have real data from purchasers that are absolutely clear with respect to who's buying those units. They're not families. I heard comparisons. I live in a single family home that's 2,400 square feet. I have four cars. I have a big double car driveway. We have five, we have six, excuse me, 600 square foot units. And the, the information that comes from the sales data and the sales interview, those units are being purchased, whether it's in Brantford on Park Road North or on projects in Hamilton or other municipalities, those units are geared to uh, whether it be new families, single car, or single person households. They're not family households with two and three cars. Those units appreciate their size. One bedroom, they are catered to those small household sizes. So, I stress that point with respect to how does this development then um, manifest itself in terms of parking requirements, which are met, and that each and every unit is provided at least one parking space, 
and in terms of the, the traffic volumes. You heard the commentary from uh, Erica Braley with regards to the peak hour traffic volumes. She gave you a number, that's the peak hour. That represents the, the maximum amount of traffic in any given hour that would be leaving and entering the site, the AM and the PM. And the numbers may be different, they may, may vary, and those numbers may flow into those hour intervals on either side. So we make those submissions to you with a specific intent of demonstrating to you that in fact, what's being proposed here is, is not beyond the realm of what was originally anticipated in terms of the scale of development. Our, yes, our, we have a large number of units, but those units are quite small. And the impacts that come as a consequence of the size of those units have been evaluated by those experts and are shown to be within the realm of what's acceptable, what was planned for. With respect to the issue of access, um, it was my client who put forward the submission that said, um, we've listened to the neighborhood, we've, we've had meetings, we've had an open house, we've heard the concerns about traffic impacts. Notwithstanding that the roads were designed to handle a much higher volume of traffic, we put forward the submission, we, we will include as part of our development, subject to city approval, we'll, we'll put forward a proposal for a write-in, write-out. Our traffic engineer evaluated it, it was found to not be necessarily warranted, but it would help with, with the perceived traffic impacts into the neighborhood and it would lessen the volume of cars that would be coming through that established neighborhood. <coughs> we feel that that's appropriate and we're prepared to work with your staff through site plan approval to engineer it an access, a right in right on access onto Sheller that's gonna be safe, functional, to the manner possible through the condominium corporation It discourages cut through traffic and it really achieves what it's meant to do, which is to, to, to lower and lessen the volume of traffic. There's also opportunities through site plan and through that larger evaluation process when we get to detailed design to talk about, you know, what elements of traffic calming may be appropriate to be implemented through the neighborhood. That regardless of what this development is happening, there's perceptions of unsafe roads in terms of speeding, the volume, the parking. All of those matters can be dealt with through, you know, whether it's traffic calming, um, proverbial speed humps, road narrowing through islands, um, you know, tactical, uh, forget the exact term, but um, there are ways to control traffic through other means to address existing concerns. And that's not beyond the realm of what could be implemented regardless of the scale of this development. We heard submissions with respect to possibly closing the access to Nightingale as had always been intended and is reflected in the subdivision that's registered and is reflected in, and effectively in a subdivision agreement. To close that access and to force a full movement onto Nightingale. You've heard the commentary from staff, it goes against the manner in which Shellard would plan. There was an EA for Shellard that affirmed that it would be a controlled access road. No direct and full moon and access is onto Shellard. I'm not sure how the EA is now affected, but there's a registered subdivision agreement on title through which my client purchased these lands with a certain expectation on being able to use that Nightingale access. If we now go back, close that access, force a full movement access on the Nightingale, we're now having to go back and revisit a, a registered subdivision agreement that is on these lands. We're not a party to that subdivision agreement. It was the original developers. Um, there, are, there are legal and legislative issues that then arise from the magnitude of that change by taking away what was originally planned in terms of that access to Nightingale and forcing the added cost, notwithstanding the additional timelines that would be involved. And I'm not sure that my client would agree that that solution in fact is appropriate. It, it may respond to the perceived impacts that we're hearing, but again, as a professional, I take the guidance of, of my experts to reach the conclusion that that is not warranted. That the traffic that results from this development will not cause a public safety issue it does not cause the need for the municipality to spend monies upgrading the existing road fabric because it was designed beginning in 2006 with this very development in mind. So Mr. Chairman, your worship, um, I trust that those comments address the questions. If there's anything on your list that I specifically have not addressed, I'd be pleased to address now. Yeah, I wonder if I could have a little, little bit of clarity on a couple of points. What will the number of visitor parking spots be? I mean, you mentioned one assigned per unit. So it's, how many? It's going to be in the range of about 35 visitor spaces. So about 30% okay. of the available parking spaces will be assigned for visitors. 
Okay. Yeah, and I've, I've been to the site. I've walked it. There are some nice trees there in the north end, the north side. Uh, how many of those trees will be kept and how many will have to come down? Yeah. Um, I realize it's a site plan <laughs> issue, but the residents have been here. Yeah. And one in particular, um, virtually. I'm, I'm going to have to defer on the answer, Your, your Worship. Um, there has been a tree preservation plan done. Again, it, it's a factor of site grading. We have been able to secure fairly significant setbacks where that interface is. So the rear elevation of those block townhouses as they relate to the backyard and the fences of those Fisher properties. You know, we've, we've been able to achieve... You know, typically is only by the one actually seven and a half meters. We're showing a ten and a half meter setback. So again, by by that distance that we're achieving, it means less disruption, which means ideally we're going to be able to retain more of those trees. I I can't give you a, a more qualified answer than that because we haven't done that detailed engineering. I don't know exactly how the grades are going to be. Again, we do have um, the encumbrance of an existing storm sewer that that flows through, and that's why that little nub remains to Fisher Street. It, it's there because this property has. Um, through the original subdivision design, it has a, an underground storm sewer that's intended to, well, and it does, it connects into the system on Fisher Street. So that's why that piece is there. Again, we'll certainly work with those neighbors to come up with appropriate fencing and screening. Uh, okay, so throw the floor open to questions. Councillors, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you indicated these are smaller units. How many bedrooms are these units? So of the 86 towns, the, sorry, the 86 stacked units, so that includes the rear lane and the other interior, 86 units in total. The way that those buildings are designed, the ground floor is one unit, yeah. and the upper two floors and the roof space is the second unit. So those ground floor units will have a floor area. Again, I just wrote this down. There is a representative of Dawn Victoria that's, that's here today. She's not speaking, but she's assisting with the details. Those units will range from 600 to 741 square feet, one bedroom units. The upper levels will range up to 1,200 square feet are intended to be two bedroom units. So that, that deals with 86, the majority of the units that are proposed. So some 43 of the units, almost 40% of what's being proposed here are very small single person households based on real market data from the sales that Don Victoria Homes has done at similar projects. And you have similar homes to that in Brantford that are selling well as one bedrooms? Yes, as I said, okay. Don Victoria Homes is, is right now, they're building out that it's been to market. Um, the, the anecdotal information of who's buying those units, it's, it's either you know, first time home buyers, um, single person households, I heard the reference to divorcees, retirees, essentially people, you know, one car households. That's, that's the market data that they derive from their sales, not just in Brantford, but in other municipalities. Okay. Um, oh, my other question, um, your parking expert talked about uh, 56 and 55 cars during peak times. What, what are the hours that they classify as peak time? Yeah. So if, if I may, uh, your worship, if Erica Bailey's able, and if she's still, she was going to try to push back a meeting, I think she's still in the virtual. I am. Yep. So Erica, if you could please respond to the question regarding the, uh, the peak hour traffics. Yep, of course. Um, so the peak hour is, um, uh, the peak hour traffic is taken from the Institute of Transportation Engineers data set um, and typical peak hours about eight to 9 a.m. Um, this would be, it would, it would actually be a conservative estimate because the data sets are taken from peak hours of, um, of proxy locations. And so it's an average of all of those hours um, into a peak hour. So a peak hour somewhere else might be eight to nine, it might be 7.30 to 8.30. And so we're actually taking um, a conservative estimate for that. Um, so it would be representative of one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon. Sorry, I understand that was a bit of a complicated answer. Did that help? This is the question, thank you. That's all my questions. Councilor McCurry. You'll forgive me if this was asked in my absence. Um, all things being equal, um, would you 
would you consider a full intersection to get folks in and out of your development uh, while stopping up the proposed access onto the side street? Through you, Mr. Chairman, I think for the reasons that I listed, I, that's, that is not a, a design solution that I believe Don Tur Homes is prepared to consider at this point. Again, you know, our, our experts tell us it's, it's not warranted based on the volumes, you know, the notion of perceived impacts versus real impacts as evaluated by the experts. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a legislative and a legal issue as it relates to the registered subdivision agreement that would need to be reopened. It was registered some 17 years ago. The cost, we've taken a preliminary look at it and I can tell you, you know, the cost is significant and it's a cost that was, was not anticipated as, as part of the development proposal. So for, for a range of reasons, um, I think I can submit on behalf of Don Victoria Homes that that full movement access is, is, is not a preferred option. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Mr. Webb. That uh, don't see any other questions. Thank you, your worship. Members of the committee, it's been a pleasure appearing before you this afternoon. Thank you. So I'm now going to close the public hearing portion of uh, this particular item. And I'd ask Councillor Sicoli if you would move the item 5.1 and please state your seconder if you have one. I will do that, certainly. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Vanderstelt, that zoning bylaw amendment application PZ 2020 submitted by Web Planning Consultants on behalf of Don Victoria Homes in Br uh, Brantford Limited, uh, ex uh, affecting lands municipally known as 12 Fisher Street to change the zoning to residential type 1C, exceptional 21 zone R1C-21, to permit six single detached dwellings and to change the zoning to residential medium den density type A, exception 81 eight zone R4A-81, to permit 86 stacked townhouse dwellings and 12 block townhouse, townhouse dwellings be approved in accordance with the applica uh, applicable provisions outlined in section 9.2 of report 2022-335 and that pursuant to section 3418.2 of the Planning Act RSO 1990 CP13, the following statement shall be included in the notice of decision. Regard has been had for all written and oral submissions received from the public before the decision was made in relation to this planning matter as discussed in section 8.2 and 9.3.1 of report 2022-335. Councillor Vanderstel, confirm you second that? Yes. All right, so the, I'll now uh, put it open discussion. I understand that the ward councillors have an amendment and to help us move this along, I would propose, unless anybody objects, that we hear the amendment, um, debate that. And then of course, once we have dealt with that, uh, the floor will then be open to making up to two comments on the resolution in its entirety. So not seeing anyone objecting to that procedure uh, to ward five or ward one councillors uh, yeah. do you have an amendment that you'd like to put on the floor absolutely mr mayor if uh, you would be so kind chris would you like me to read it mr mayor please thank you um moved by myself seconded by councillor sicoli uh, that clause A be amended to include the following provisions that staff be directed to prepare the necessary implement, uh, implementing zoning bylaw to include a holding uh, zone provision subject to all the required studies and plans, which include options for a right in, right out access onto Sheller. Being submitted for a, a site plan control application to the satisfaction of the chief planner and director of planning and development services. Uh, <clears throat> all at the expense of the owner and that staff be directed to prepare the necessary documents to lift only a portion of the uh, 0.3 meter reserve for the proposed access driveway of 12 Fisher Street fronting the Shellard Lane right-of-way 
and that the respective dedication bylaw be placed on the next available council meeting. And so to the amendment. Speaking to the amendment, um, uh, first of all, thank you so much to, to reps from Don Victoria Homes, crunching these numbers over and over again and, and trying to find a compromise. Um, it's, it's not easy in this situation when, uh, you know, 85% of the, the, the people in the area sign a petition and say, you know what, we were, we were told this, this might not even ever happen. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're aghast at what we think is going to happen. And we want to make sure that we have some sort of control, some sort of measure of control about what what's happening to our cul-de-sacs, our sleepy little cul-de-sacs. It, it's completely understandable. We, we come across this argument on a regular basis. I want to thank staff too for going <laughs> writing this amendment against their better recommendations because what we have here is uh, just, just a part answer to the problem um, of trying to divert some of the traffic flow uh, one or two trips out of the day in order to alleviate some of the traffic congestion on the, uh, on the, on the smaller side streets and the cul-de-sacs. Um, and and they've, they've done yeoman's work. We've, we've tried to negotiate the best possible, possible scenario. Um, if we were to take it a step further, which, which may come later, Mr. Mayor and committee members, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would ask that you consider the fact that we installed a crosswalk at the fire hall in West Bryant, not too far away from this location, uh, just down the street from a signalized inter intersection from Oak Hill. So um, that is also a four lane artery leading into town. And we, had, we, we didn't have any problem installing those two signalized uh, um, locations. Um, following up on what already existed with the new crosswalk, we absorbed the cost of that, of that upgrade. And I would also point your attention to um, the Apotex shared cost crosswalk that we, uh, we made sure we negotiated with Apotex with you know, the 400 employees that are crossing the road there. Uh, and that was a shared cost venture where we looked at uh, the options of, of how we could better um, provide a level, of, an increased level of safety for not only the drivers, but pedestrians in the area. So there, there may be a, um, another recommendation that may come forward but what I'm asking uh, members of the committee to consider is that this is a uh, it, it very much in the same fashion in which Don Victoria Homes um, reduced the intensity of the proposed build in, in putting in the six um, residential properties, um, reducing the parking needs, reducing the, uh, the, the footprint, if you would. Um, what, I would uh, what I would consider um, as, as being helpful as well is if we, you know, you could presumably uh, assume that at the end of every day, uh, when everyone's trying to wind their way back home through, you know, sleepy cul-de-sacs and, and small streets, that they have the option of heading straight through the light at Conklin and taking a right into their, into their, their, uh, their condominium complex, which would, would eliminate all of that traffic at that point. It's, it's not the best compromise that we could find with the three parties, but it's certainly something that I, I would be willing to uh, obviously bring forward and, and ask for your support on uh, members of council. Um, and as I said, there, there may be another opportunity for uh, a little bit of a, of a massage on that point of view, but uh, I would ask for your support. Thank you. Councillor Sikoli. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to give a shout out right now to this man, Councillor Vanderstel, who has been working so hard on this way before my time here and has done his best to fill me in and get me up to speed and um, fill me in on what the residents are thinking in the area. Um, as you may know, I, I am a neighbor, so I'm familiar with, with the neighborhood and I'm familiar with the cars zipping through those streets and I'm familiar with how many children are playing on the roads ball hockey and basketball every other house has a basketball net and I just can't imagine dumping forcing another 150 cars down a cul-de-sac knowing the environment on those streets. So um, I've been doing this juggling act and, and catching up. And I think we can all agree that a lot has changed in our community since 2005. 
when this was first um, approved. Um, so I do have a question of staff at this point. Is it reasonable to request from you a memo um, by council meeting um, so with a, a cost analysis of what a signalized intersection would look like there and taking into account the cost that um, the builder may um, be okay with assuming with the right in, right out. Is that re the, a reasonable request? <laughs> through the chair, Heidi DeVries, general manager of People Legislated Services and Planning. City staff can certainly prepare a memorandum on the cost of intersection improvements, including what the developer's agent has indicated today the developer may be willing to contribute to, which is not a signalized intersection, just for clarification. Yeah. And um, I, with one caveat, that would be a very high level estimate, given that there are a number of consultant reports that would be involved in the preparation of actual costs in this instance. So it would be very similar to the ballpark figures I gave you for an OLT appeal. Okay, so I'm going to leave it right there for now and just request that a memo um, come to council when we look to ratify this so that we can make a, a proper decision at that time, I feel. Thank you. Councilor Schles. Oh, sorry, Councilor McQuarrie. No need to be sorry, Mayor. Uh, through you to staff. Um, the proponent had indicated that they would be unwilling to consider a full signalized intersection because um, they were concerned about the original EA for this road and they were uh, concerned about the original uh, subdegree subdivision agreement. Uh, so by creating this opening, uh, is that not pretty much the same thing? Through the chair, um, with respect to creating the opening, does just for seeking clarification on that question? Yes. So, um, if 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 we're if cars are going to be coming in and out of the site, um, how does that differ with respect to the EAA or the subdivision agreement from what a full intersection would consist of? So, I can speak to with respect to the legal matters in the subdivision agreement. That was. Uh, with respect to the closure of an existing legal access to Nightingale. Um, and I would ask uh, Mr. Peaver to answer the question with respect to the impact of a, of a right in right out rather than signalized intersection um, when it comes to the EA consideration. Okay, so so what, what it revolves around is the, the maintenance of the uh, cul-de-sac entrance. That has to remain as part of the subdivision. Sub, I'm having trouble with saying that word, uh, subdivision agreement. So that that's the, that's the um, that's the hill that dies on. Through the chair, uh, that would be correct. You okay. have, you have a, a legal access on a, an existing registered plan of subdivision, um, and uh, the the issue that is giving rise to that right now is whether or not through a zoning bylaw amendment, a municipal council can remove a legal access, which would require a legal report. And I'm not about to suggest that. I know you're busy. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Schloss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I think my, my first question was just answered uh, by Mr. Vries, and that is that we we don't have legal jurisdiction to close off uh, the Nightingale access. Um, so I guess that answers that question. The other question was that there, there certainly was concerns raised, and I agree with them, on the uh, on the walkway access. Um, you know, I understand that there's infrastructure under there, but it... it um, is there not a way to, to, to deal with that in, in this resolution? It, it, it appeared to be a, a concern of the neighborhood. Uh, I don't know that the ward councillors would know far better than I, uh, and I'm so pleased to support anything they put forward. I'm just wondering if that's something that could be uh, looked at uh, maybe through site plan. I'm not really sure. So yeah, it's not really relevant to the amendment, but um... Fair question. So can we get an answer from staff on that? So through the chair uh, to the councillor, Nicole Wilmot, Director of Planning and Development Services, that's an issue that we can definitely take a look at and the ramifications of that through the site plan control process. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Nicole. Anyone else to the amendment? Sure. All right. Yeah, I would just say this. Um, uh, yes, I, I was in the area. Uh, quite familiar with the street and the residents and 
met lots of the children that uh, <clears throat> play there. I have some concerns. It goes back to the whole block planning process. I'll save that for when the amendment is dealt with. But, you know, Otto Bismarck said, politics is the art of the possible. It's the art of the attainable. It's the art of the next best. It's not, it's not the art of the, 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 the absolute best possible scenario from one perspective. And, that, and that's the problem here. We're not, the reality is that we're not the final word when it comes to planning applications like this. Our decisions are appealable to the Ontario Land Tribunal, which can could look at a whole new application submitted by the applicant, uh, not including an access onto Shellard. And the Ontario Land Tribunal will, will deal with it as they see fit. And so that's what we're always dealing with when we have a, a, a matter before us as a planning board. And that is making ideally a solution that everyone agrees to, including the proponent. Thus, there's no appeals, there's no delay, everyone's happy. And we always strive to find that and achieve that because no one really wins when it gets appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal. It's a huge cost to the proponent, to the city. Uh, the result is uncertain. It could, in fact, be a result that's worse for the neighborhood. And so when you have something like this that, you know, I agree the ideal solution probably is a right in a left out, but it's very expensive and potentially, and we'll get an MMO on that, <clears throat> but I expect it'll confirm what I, in my bones, know that it's expensive. And the developer has said that they're not going to pay for it. They'll pay for the cost of right in, right out. And, and so... You know, should other rate payers, should other property taxpayers pay that cost? And that's what kind of what it comes down to. Plus, if you try and impose it on an unwilling um, property owner, they likely can take it to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And I doubt the Ontario Land Tribunal would consider something like this in a minute. So we're trying to arrive at a compromise. That's what uh, the ward councillors have struggled towards. And I know from dealing with councillors Vanderstel and Councillor Weaver before that. They've spent a lot of time on this, now Councillor Sicoli. Uh, this amendment, I think, achieves, uh, addresses some of the concerns of the residents, uh, has got the developer to a point where they'll agree to pay for it and cooperate on that. Um, and we do seem to have a, a willing owner that uh, you know bought land that was its own medium density, not single family residential. So all things considered, I can support it. It's not perfect from everyone's perspective, but it's the attainable, it's the possible. So oh, any other comments? If not, Mr. Clerk, take the vote. The amendment to item 5.1 carries unanimously on a recorded vote of seven to zero. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. All right, so we have it amended. Uh, any discussion or debate on the resolution as it's now amended? Councillor Vanderstelt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would ask um, prior to the council meeting that members of committee and council take into consideration that um, if you mentally drive down um, Shellard's uh, right now, what you will see between the two schools on the hill is a private entrance onto the peak of the hill, the crest of the hill, uh, it, albeit it's not a densely populated uh, kind of corporation, but that is a private entrance. Uh, recently, uh, I'd also encourage you to visit the site if you haven't been there before, and you'll see that train, the train development that uh, occurred on the corner, and it's still occurring on the corner of Shellard and Compton. Uh, they have an exit onto Compton as well as Shellard's. And it's it's a little bit difficult to, um, to, to not shoot for the option of right in uh, 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 sorry, right in, uh, right out in this case, uh, because it seems to be fairly consistent, at least in two other cases, not to mention what's going to happen further down Sheller later on. Um, if we've made exceptions, one by, uh, by the existence 
prior to the EA, uh, in the first uh, instance I mentioned, we, we certainly have to take into consideration that train was successful in gaining access to Shallard's Lane uh, just recently. So it's it's something to consider when we get through, when we receive uh, hopefully a memo from staff uh, reporting on the options of uh, an intersection, a full intersection at that area. Um, I, I'd ask you to take that under consideration when we discuss this again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make one comment. Um, I think what comes out of this for me as a warning to us as a council and the next council, when we do the, the block planning process for the boundary lands, how critical that is. Because the way this whole subdivision was set up with this piece of land kind of in the middle of the subdivision, designated for this type of a development, not single family homes. I mean, that decision was made 15, 20 years ago when they designed the whole outlay of this subdivision. And to my mind, ideally, this, this kind of a development would have been on the west side of this larger area fronted by McGinnis on the one side and Conklin on the other. And that's where it probably should have been. You know, that's the problem. That decision was made when the when the whole block plan was done for this a quarter century ago, and it, it ties our hands at this time. Um, so I think that's just a, it's a fair warning to to us, to staff and councils that as we develop the block plans for the boundary lands, uh, we've got to really think hard and consider all these issues and and use the lessons we've learned over the last 20 years. Any other discussion for Yes, Councilor Carpenter. Yes, I, I think when this area was contemplated with the access granted off of Nightingale, the uh, the conception, the only thing in the community that was being built was single story townhouse style condominiums. There wasn't such thing as stacked towns anywhere in the community or even thought of. And I'm sure that was the idea that there would be in this location, maybe 35, 40, up to 40, 50, stacked townhouses or not stacked townhouses condominiums single story seniors uh, i think that was the concept what was to be put there uh, when the land was proposed and now it's stacked townhouses people living on top of each other and more more density and i guess the province wants to make it so that the, you can the builders can build anything anywhere coming soon to, to a to a council near you um so i i think that we should have had we should have had some forethought when we when they started seeing stack towns, as I think the councillors for the ward have done a good job here. We should have full access to Shutters Lane, and we should contemplating. Uh, I'm glad we got the six houses, lots of so that the neighbor can maintain its integrity. But we should have had a full access point off of Shutter Lane going forward as part of this process. Thank you. Seeing no for the raised hands. Uh... Mr. Deputy Clerk, please take the vote. Item 5.1 as amended carries on a recorded vote of six to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councillor Spanner Sless, Martin McCreary Sokoli, Mayor Davis, members opposed, Councillor Carpenter. All right, so that completes the first item. We're now going to, we have three other items to deal with. Uh, but we are going to take a half hour break before we reconvene. Do we have yeah. So we're going to reconvene at uh, five o'clock.
Yeah, Steph, I believe it's Stephanie who's in the virtual waiting room. If you would uh, please turn on your video and your audio microphone, if you would identify yourself, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Stephanie Murdich, and I'm a registered professional planner and an associate with MHPC Planning. Uh, representing Granite Reed, I assume? That's correct. All right. So please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. So as mentioned, I'm here today on behalf of Granite Reach for the Granite Telephone City Logistics Center, which is a large scale industrial development. Um, many of you are familiar with the subject lands. They were previously owned by TCA. The current address is uh, subject to the applications before you today are six to 14 Pipe Street and two to 10 Bowery Road. Um, before I begin, just generally, we have reviewed the staff report and we're supportive of the staff report and the recommendation for approval today. We've been working with staff on this application and several other ongoing applications for the proposed development. So today I'll provide a brief overview of the application and uh, go through the request for the zoning bylaw amendment. Next slide, please. So the subject lands are designated general employment in the city's official plan, which permits the proposed employment uses. And the subject lands are zoned uh, various site-specific provisions of M2. Uh, so M253, M254, and M255. Uh, the purpose of the application is to, um, now that Granite Reed has purchased the property and the proposed uses are known, um, which are primarily warehousing, distribution, and light manufacturing uses, many of the smaller lots that were registered as part of the plan of subdivision are being consolidated for larger parcels to reflect the current market conditions. Uh, the purpose of the application, therefore, is to revise some of the site-specific zoning that is in place, which was originally approved in 2013 for the subdivision, uh, to allow for those consolidations to occur and for the lands to be developed for employment uses as intended. So the overall zone for the lots is not changing, and the intent to develop these for employment uses is being maintained. Um, we're looking at some general provision amendments. For example, modifying the list of uh, permitted uses to remove reference to previous uses, which are no longer there. So it was a previous uh, pit and quarry site and there was an asphalt plant on site. So those have been removed now from the proposed bylaw. Uh, and the other requests relate to various portions of the uh, property, which I will go through now. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview map that shows the areas of the plan that we're proposing to amend. Uh, so you can see the three different colors and the three different areas. So I'll go through each of those uh, in detail, but generally the, the amendments apply just to those, those areas that you see on the screen. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for development block one is what we call on the south side of Oak Park Road, uh, bounded by Oak Park, Bowery and Wright Street. Uh, this was previously eight, lo eight blocks on a plan of subdivision that was registered. Uh, they are now being consolidated into one larger parcel to permit the development of a large scale industrial building. So there's some site specific amendment requests related to this site. Um, the first is to permit a revised parking rate of one space per 150 square meters for manufacturing uses instead of the required one space per 200. And this meets the requirements of the proposed tenant and their needs for employee and visitor parking and will maintain adequate parking uh, on the site. Uh, another proposed amendment is to permit a maximum height of 30 meters for specifically for accessory silo structures. Those are required for the proposed use. Uh, and as part of that request, we are also including a minimum 30 meter setback from the open space, which uh, on the screen is on the right hand side. And that will just ensure that there's sufficient setback um, from the open space and the residential lands located further to the south uh, from that proposed 30 meter silo. And finally, just an amendment to the provision, provisions uh, related to open storage to ensure that open storage is permitted on the property in accordance with provisions of the bylaw. And we've proposed to add a additional provision requiring a three meter landscape or planting strip, which will make sure that any open storage is well screened from the public streets, given that this has frontage on three public roads. Next slide, please. So the second request relates to a uh, portion abutting uh, the old rail lands to the north. Um, the request here, there's a provision in the bylaw that requires a 15 meter buffer um, 
or a setback from the open space. There's a portion you can see in the image on the bottom right. Um, there's a small sliver there of land that is zoned as open space. Um, it's currently vacant uh, and it's not proposed to be part of the development. But because this property abuts the open space, that requirement for the 15 meters is there. So the request is to uh, amend that buffer to zero to allow for the land at the rear of these blocks to be used for um, vehicle access, such as trucks, floating, parking, uh, and grading in those areas. Um, you can see an example of one of the site plans here and, and that there still is sufficient space at the rear of the buildings for landscaping. It's just uh, reducing that to allow for the parking and, and other things to be located at the rear of that property. And this applies to uh, about three of the development blocks. Next slide, please. Uh, so this one is a bit more, there's two blocks uh, that'll be part of this site. So it's the M253. And the requested amendment here is to permit warehouse uses on the lot in the blocks. Um, right now, warehousing is a permitted use, but only as an accessory use. So up to 50% of the total floor area. So we're just requesting to amend that so that warehousing is permitted as the primary use on the site. And similar to the first request, uh, the same request is being made for the for open storage, recognizing that the smaller the smaller lots are now being consolidated to ensure that open storage is permitted on the site. And again, uh, requesting that uh, provision be added to ensure that there is that three meter landscape uh, planting strip to allow for sufficient screening. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, the application and request before you uh, conform to the general employment designation in the official plan. Uh, they also maintain the current zoning and the current intent of the zoning to develop these blocks for employment related uses. Uh, overall, the proposed development will promote economic development and competitiveness and allow for the development of these lands for various industrial uses and significant job creation. And details associated with building and site design will be addressed to the site plan control application. Um, there are currently four site plan applications that are in for processing with the city, uh, with several others to follow for the various blocks. Um, so again, we've reviewed the staff report. We're supportive of the recommendation for approval, and we're looking forward to continuing to work with staff on the various applications to move this exciting development forward. So thanks for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Stephanie. So any questions for the proponent? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, there may be some further questions for you after we finish the other parts of the public hearing. So we'll now move to planning staff and I believe Nicole, well, Nicole Goodbrand will be doing the presentation. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, and members of the committee um, in our very quiet public area. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So for the sake of timing, um, I'm going to cut my previously planned presentation just because of the excellent kind of synopsis that Stephanie already provided. Um, but of course, I can provide any additional information following uh, my presentation. So of course, these applications pertain uh, to uh, a variety of properties in this case, um, from six to 14 Pipe Street, one uh, to 12, and then 50 to 58 Wright Street, and then two to 10 Bowery Road. The lands are currently designated under the general employment land use designation. And the applicant is requesting to amend the existing site specific zonings to facilitate the use of the land for larger industrial uses. Next slide, please. Uh, so as she mentioned, uh, the lands are probably familiar to the uh, committee uh, through the previously or previous ownership of TCA lands, um, but it is a part of a newly established business park in the north northwest part of Brantford, north of the Grand River and south of Hardy Road. And uh, the lands are vacant, but as the committee is probably aware, uh, they are actively um, going through undergoing preliminary site grading works. Next slide, please. 
So the applicant is proposing amendments to all three of the applicable land zones in the subject lands, <laughs> that being M253, M254, and M255, with the secondary numbers being their site-specific exceptions. Uh, the proposed site-specific amendments to the zone include requests that apply to each specific zone with some duplication. Um, they range from, the, as Stephanie no noted, the uh, ability to have warehouse uses uh, in addition to just being an accessory use, to reduce required setbacks, to open space zones, to reduce parking rates for manufacturing uh, uses, and eliminating references to previously existing uses, as well as more, um, which I'll uh, kind of just briefly touch on. Uh, in a second. Next slide, please. Uh, as always, uh, the proposal uh, is reviewed against the growth plan, provincial policy statement, as well as any other relevant policy. Um, so this application uh, was uh, compared against those and is considered uh, consistent with those planning policies. And in this case, as I mentioned before, uh, it's currently designated general employment um, within the new official plan. And that being said, uh, definitely is a conforming use. The designation is intended to accommodate employment uses that are industrial in nature uh, and remain a crucial component of the city's economy. Next slide, please. Uh, so just as noted previously, the current zonings are uh, proposed to be modified. So the numbers would stay the same. Uh, we're looking at exception 53 through to 55. Next slide, please. All right, and I think I have a few clicks here, um, but uh, just for the sake of timing, uh, I have the kind of synopsis on the slide before you. Uh, so for exception 53, we're looking at a proposal uh, to include warehouses of permitted use, as Stephanie mentioned, permitting open storage near those open space areas and removing reference to the asphalt plant. And in relation to exception 54, reducing that open space buffering once again, and removing the holding provision as it pertains to the exi uh, previously existing uses specifically. Uh, next slide, please. There'll be a couple clicks. Perfect. Uh, so in regards to exception 55, again, we're looking at removing references to the pits and quarries, asphalt plant, and agricultural uses that were previously permitted, um, but that permission is no longer required. Um, and then specifically for the site, um, as she indicated with a proposed site plan, there's a, a request to reduce uh, the parking rate specifically applying to the manufacturing uses, uh, permitting that open storage in, uh, for these uses when they abut an open space, um, as the whole site will, um, as well as the permission of an accessory structure building height of 30 meters, specifically for that silo, um, and a setback to accompany that uh, to ensure that the uh, height doesn't have any impacts on the, the surrounding area. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide. In regards to public input, uh, in this instance, in consultation with the ward councillors, the requirement for a neighbourhood meeting was waived in favour of written notice. Uh, that notice was sent on May 10th and was circulated to 30 addresses. No public comments have been received uh, to date by planning staff regarding the application. Next slide, please. In regards to development considerations, uh, similar to many of our other applications, we looked at a variety of issues, including site plan control, environmental impacts, traffic considerations, and compatibility in urban design. In regards to the specific details of the proposed development, an application for site plan approval, of course, would be required. Um, some of the lands are subject to site plan applications that have been submitted in anticipation of this uh, zoning by law amendment. Um, in regards to environmental impacts, the subject lands do fall within areas uh, that are a part are considered as a part of the natural heritage system. As a part of the original plan of subdivision and zoning applications, which were submitted back in 2011 and approved in 2014, an environmental impact study was completed and peer reviewed at the request of the city. Through the study, draft plan conditions were established to address environmental concerns, including the development of an environmental implementation report. The EIR, as it's known, was submitted in September of 2020, and the conditions associated with the environment were cleared. 
Additionally, uh, lands of significant interest in the area and the buffering area surrounding that were separated and identified through open space zoning in the parks and open space designation. So you'll see that kind of buffering uh, the, the area subject to this application. Um, as a part of this submission, the proposed zoning bylaw for this proposed zoning bylaw amendments, a traffic impact study and parking reduction justification letter were provided. Um, the traffic impact study uh, identified no negative impacts as a result of the proposed development and the requested amendments to the zoning bylaw. Uh, comments provided by development transportation supported those findings as well. Given the nature of the proposed alterations, an urban design brief was not required for the zoning bylaw amendment application. Instead, the design of the proposal will be fully evaluated at the time of site plan submission. In a general sense, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment supports the vision for employment lands as articulated in the urban design manual. Uh, much of the open space is already protected through the city's ownership. Uh, the transit route expansion is also already being explored by staff as directed by council by resolution on June 28th. 2022. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, is the opinion of staff that uh, this proposal does support the continued use of the lands for industrial purposes. It does provide an increase in potential employment opportunities um, and is consistent with the provincial policy statement, the growth plan and the city's official plan. Next slide, please. So to conclude, staff are recommending that the lands be rezoned as outlined in the staff report and staff support the application as amended as they're consistent with that PPS growth plan and official plan and represent good planning. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nicole. Any questions uh, for Nicole? No questions, the perfect presentation. So we'll now move to uh, members of the public. This is the point where they can participate. At uh, this time, we've had uh, zero registered virtual members of the public agreeing to participate. And I don't see anybody in the council chamber, but I'll make the three statements anyways. Uh, is there anyone present uh, in the chamber that would like to speak to this matter either for and against? Is there anyone present in the council chamber that would like to speak to this matter either for or against? Is there anyone present in the council chamber that would like to speak to this matter either for or against? your last opportunity, seeing no one. So I'm going to ask uh, Stephanie, did you want to return to provide any further comment, I guess in response to uh, the presentation by planning staff? Thank you. No, I have no further comments. Uh, thanks, Nicole, for the detailed presentation. And again, happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. So I'm not seeing any hands raised. So uh, thank you very much. To, oops, Councillor Sluss, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one, and you might not be able to answer this stuff, but I believe in the first block you referenced uh, that there is a tenant uh, is the rest on speculation or are they building or, or is it leased out? Through the mayor to the councillor, thanks for the question. Uh, that's correct. There is a confirmed tenant for block one. Uh, the remaining blocks at this point are being built on speculation. Thank you. Are you at liberty to say who, uh, who the tenant is? Yep, I can confirm that it's Barry Calibo, uh, chocolate Excellent. manufacturer for block one. Thank you. All right, so we'll now need to get the resolution on the floor. And I believe, Councillor Celeste, you might have this resolution. If you could confirm that, state your seconder and read the resolution. Uh, yes, I can confirm I have it, uh, Mr. Mayor, but uh, seeking a seconder. Uh, Councillor Carpenter is seconding it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Carpenter. That zoning bylaw amendment application TZ-13-22 submitted by MHBC Planning on behalf of Granite Rate affecting lands at 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 Pipe Street, 1, 2, 9, 12, 50, 58, and 54 Wright Street, and 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 Bowery Road, City of Brantford to amend the zoning of the lands from General Industrial Exception 53 M253 General Industrial, Exception 54 M2-54, 
and General Industrial Exception 55 M2-55 to, to an amended General Industrial Exception 53 M2-53 as amended General Industrial M M2-54 and an amended General Industrial Exception 55 M2-55 to permit the development of the lands for larger industrial uses be approved in accordance with the applicable provisions as noted in section 9-3 of report 2022-423 and that pursuant to section 3418-1 of the Planning Act RSO 1990, the following statement shall be included in the notice of decision that regard has been had for all written and oral submissions received from the public before the decision was made in relation to this planning matter as discussed in section 8.2 of report 2022-423. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So any discussion? Seeing none, um, Mr. Deputy Clerk, please take the vote. Item 5.2 carries unanimously on a recorded vote of eight to zero. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Celeste, Marn, Wall, Carpenter, McCreary, Sicoli, and Mayor Davis. All right, we'll move to item number three, which is an application for zoning bylaw amendment PZ 0822, 346 Shellard Lane. And now ask the applicant to appear before the committee. I believe we have Someone from, is it David Folletta? Thank you, your worship, uh, members of council. My name is David Folletta and I'm a registered professional planner with those fields. Uh, shall I just go into the uh, yeah, presentation? Would, so yeah. you're here on behalf of the Shell Brand Development Limited, uh, their proponent. Correct. Okay, proceed. Uh, thank you. As I mentioned, uh, we're here on behalf of the applicant, who is uh, Lynn Vest. Um, and uh, I want to start by thanking staff for all their work on this project and all the report. We are fully supportive of staff's recommendation. I'll, I just have a very brief presentation. Um, what I'll be going through today is some background, purpose of the application, and then just some summary of what's contained in the staff report. And again, we're fully supportive of staff's work. Uh, specifically, I wanted to shout out to uh, Karen Pongratz, Joe Muto, and Nicole Wilmot for all their work in facilitating um, the report before you today. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of some background, we know that um, Council approved the draft plan of subdivision for rezoning this site back in November of 2020, including a draft plan of subdivision and included a range of uses, including uh, townhouses, uh, single detached dwellings, a new park, new commercial facilities, and some stormwater management facilities. Um, uh, so the applications before the committee this evening uh, are specifically related to mod further modifications to those zones. Next slide, please. Um, what you see on the screen on the right side is, is the draft plan. And what we've done is highlight the areas that are being further modified from those original uh, approvals that were granted by council in uh, 2020. Uh, specifically modifications to the lane townhouse units. And we're gonna go through those in a minute. Um, and then uh, the, the original draft plan that was approved in November included partial lots adjacent to the natural heritage system. Um, and the ownership group has now purchased those additional lands from uh, the city to make them whole. Uh, and we are rezoning those today for eight additional dwelling units. And then finally, there's just a correction to the commercial block. It had a, uh, a labeling error on it, and we're just cleaning that up through this rezoning application. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier that there's some additional zoning modifications that we're looking for uh, related to the uh, Lane townhouse units. So these are the units that are front onto a municipal street, and then they are accessed by a public rear lane. Uh, as we got into detailed design, we asked, uh, you know, we, we were looking for some additional relief related to maximum lot coverage for detached garages. Um, 
And what that does is that allows us to provide additional parking within those detached garages. We're also looking to increase the uh, maximum building height for those detached garages by half a meter or um, 18 inches. And then finally, uh, we're looking for a reduced setback for those detached garages to the laneway. And this is a widened laneway at 10 meters or 33 feet. Um, and again, we're just looking to increase uh, or sorry, reduce that setback from the garage to that uh, to that laneway. And finally, um, the last modification for this uh, zoning is related to parking spaces. We know that on the end units, there's an opportunity to provide some additional parking um for these units and you can have a parking pad and in that regard additional modification is required between uh sorry in order to reduce that setback between that that spot and the lot line next slide please um in terms of the uh, rezoning of those partial lots again i i did mention that there are eight lots they're highlighted here for you in red uh, and those lands were per recently purchased from the city. And we've confirmed with the Conservation Authority as well as city staff that these lots are all outside of the natural heritage features um, and, and outside of the buffer area. So we know that we're not intruding into that nat natural heritage system. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, it's just a, a labeling error re related to the commercial block. We're just getting that cleaned up. So again, uh, next slide, please. Um, at this point, I, I do want to reiterate that we're thankful of staff and we do uh, fully support the recommendations. And at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any, any committee members? Uh, Councillor McCurry, then Councillor Sicoli. Uh, welcome and thank, for, thank you for your presentation. The uh, rear laneway garages, a future owner could convert each of those to a, um, a separate uh, dwelling unit, correct? Uh, through you, your, your worship, there are regulations in the bylaw that do allow that. Uh, however, there's a certain criteria, including building code requirements that would have to be achieved. And the parking is all, uh, there's, there's no parking in the front of these units, is that correct? Uh, correct. Uh, through you, uh, your worship, uh, they're accessed through a walkway to the, to the front street. Uh, and uh, the city of Brantford would be plowing the alleys? Through you, Mr. Uh, or uh, your worship, yes, they, they they would be their public laneways. So we would be servicing one and a half times what we ordinarily would with respect to new developments. Um, through through your worship, uh, in, in terms of what the uh, relation is to uh, to servicing plowing through snow. I don't know exactly. We haven't done that financial analysis, but we do know that the official plan that's adopted by this council does encourage uh, alternative forms of housing like this, including laneway housing. We know that it provides some different housing options for the community and some more uh, intense forms of housing. And in this specific uh, case we're not looking to to change that in any way we're looking mostly to to modify and allow for uh, additional parking so bigger uh, detached garages yeah thank you councillor sicoli yeah i think just for clarification there's the laneway at the rear with the garages and then there's parking in the front as well uh, through your worship, uh, I do apologize. I, I kind of skimmed through that very quickly, and I do apologize. So in the front, there is no parking. It's basically the street, then there's the public sidewalk, and there are individual walkways to people's front doors. All of the parking is in the rear along the laneways. The laneway is quite wide. Typically, in most municipalities, including the City of Toronto, uh, Milton, and others, uh, the laneway is six meters. In Brantford, you've, you've called for a wider laneway at 10 meters in order to accommodate larger vehicles for snow plowing. And that's where beyond the laneway, you get into a driveway and a parking garage uh, uh, and a detached garage situation. Okay, so then in within the Lane Town Home Complex, is there, are you still supplying visitor parking and such? Yeah, through you, your worship, we're actually exceeding the minimum parking requirements. So uh, there, there is an abundance of parking for visitors, including on-street parking. Uh, so when you do have, uh, you know, when you don't have any driveways in the front, there's an, uh, an abundance of additional parking permitted. Uh, and that, that allows for it. And last comment, I think I saw a turning circle in that design. Did I see a turning circle? 
You, you, you did uh, through you, uh, your worship. Absolutely, you did. And that was something that came through as part of the draft plan of subdivision. It was uh, 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 highly recommended by, uh, by this council and we, we definitely implemented it for you. I love that. Thank you so much. David, it looks like there are no other, oh, Councillor Walt. Thank you. So they're not condos, right? Uh, through you, uh, through you, um, uh, your worship, these, these units, uh, the tenure has not been resolved at this point, uh, but I do anticipate them to be freehold. So they could be either freehold or condominium, uh, but because they're on a public lane, it's likely that they will be freehold. Again, they haven't been sold and the tenure hasn't been resolved at this point. Uh, we wanted to get all these approvals in place first, but it's likely to be freehold. So my concerns are just regarding that laneway. Um, if it was freehold condos on a condo road, could they not have an association fee that would cover like snow removal or I just don't know how our vehicles are supposed to service that. Uh, through, through you, your worship, uh, again, we, we've, we worked very hard and closely with uh, your city staff, including your engineering staff, in order to ensure that that uh, laneway was designed to your standards. Um, and again, that was all done as part of the draft plan of subdivision. So we're not seeking to modify that in any way. We're just here to add some additional uh, modifications to the zoning for uh, those laneway homes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I think that's it for questions. Thank you very much, David. So we'll now uh, ask staff if they would um, please present planning staff. Thank you, Mayor Davis and members of committee. My name is Casey Pongrass and I'm a senior planner with the planning department. Let me just advance here. Next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the applicant has done a, a comprehensive presentation, so I'll, uh, I'll move th through this rather quickly. Uh, the purpose of this application is to um, amend the zoning bylaw, uh, to amend the provisions that were adopted through uh, P0719 and the plan of subdivision, which was adopted in November 2020. Next slide, please. This report evaluates an application uh, to amend the zoning bylaw and modify the zoning for the Lane Townhouse units, which are shown on this uh, plan. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, they are the, uh, the curved area. Uh, it's also to um, modify the blocks 173, 174, 211 to 216 on the draft plan of subdivision. Um, and, and the lands behind them that were recently acquired from the city in order to permit the development of eight additional single detached dwellings and to make a correction to the zone label of block 207. There we go, now I have control. Uh, so with respect to the commercial block, this is simply a mapping amendment uh, as mentioned by the applicant. Um, the map shows it as HC10-7. Uh, there is no site-specific C7 provision that applies to these lands. So therefore they are just being uh, corrected to H-C10. With respect to the future development blocks, um, the block on the right, which is shown in the check, uh, there are two lots in that location. and they are to be rezoned to a site-specific R1D-13. The site-specific provisions are related to the fact that um, this, these lots are very shallow, but they're wide. So the existing provisions in the R1D zone don't 
uh, fit with this lot configuration. So we are introducing site specific uh, zoning provisions for that block. And that has to do with the uh, reduced lot depth uh, rear yard requirement. In this instance, on those two lots, uh, they will their amenity space will essentially be their side yard as opposed to a rear yard, which you would see in a typical uh, single detached residence. Uh, with respect to the lots on the west side on the left, uh, those are going to be rezoned to an HR1D-12 zone, which is the zoning that's consistent with the lots that are to the north of this. Um, the lots outside of the dotted area, and you can see them on the right of the presentation in the uh, draft reference plan. Those lands were acquired from the city to be added to the to the rear of these lots, uh, and in, in combination, they will create new single detached lots. There was an environmental impact study that was submitted with the original subdivision, uh, and then there was an addendum supplied with this uh, application. The Grand River Conservation Authority has reviewed that addendum and does not have any concerns. Uh, as mentioned by the applicant, these portions are outside of the buffer area and outside of the core natural area. Uh, so planning staff is recommending that these may be rezoned. With respect to the Lane townhouse units, there are three points uh, that are being requested for relief. One is the lot coverage. Accessory, uh, accessory units in single detached zones are permitted to have 10% lot coverage. In this instance, the applicant is requesting a 20% lot coverage in order that they can supply double car garages on that rear laneway rather than single car garages. As mentioned, there, there are no parking uh, there's no availability of parking in the front of these units, so all of the parking will be at the rear. The applicants are asking for an increase in building height. The zoning bylaw currently permits a height of 4.5 for these uh, accessory garages, and the applicant is requesting five. Uh, planning staff does not have an issue with this increase, uh, the request in the increased height. With respect to the accessory rear and interior side yard setbacks, the rear yard for these garages is to be 0 0.6 meters from the laneway. The applicant is requesting 0 0.3 meters. Uh, in addition, identified by the building department was uh, an interior side yard requirement. Where these garages abut one another, there is a, a zero, um, zero meter interior side yard. And that needs to be recognized within the amending zoning bylaw. And there's one further, sorry, one further request by the applicant. Um, and that is in the instance where they are not double car garages. On some of these end units, they are only single car garages. So the applicant has requested that a parking space be permitted next to the garage. Typically in an R4A, there is a requirement for a one meter setback for the parking spaces from adjacent property lines. And typically the R4A has um, a block townhouse format whereby uh, they would have parking that's communal. So it's a parking lot. In those instances, we require those setbacks to be one meter. In this instance, however, even though it's zoned R4A, they function, those end units function similar to a single detached dwelling. Uh, and a single detached dwelling does not have a requirement for a setback from an adjacent property line. The applicant has requested a 0 0.3 meter setback on, in those instances, and planning staff is in support of that. So in conclusion, uh, the, the lands are designated residential. Uh, and they're consistent with the provincial policy statement, the growth plan and the city's official plan. Uh, and planning staff is in support of the requested amendments. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So do any members have any, any questions? Councilor Martin. Thank you. The diagrams that we got in our package aren't very clear on this. Can you identify where the visitor parking is for the, these lane townhouses? So these are considered street townhouses, um, and there is a requirement for 1.5 spaces per 
unit. Um, there is not a requirement in the zoning bylaw for visitor parking. And even in all of these instances where we see visitor parking in the condominium units, um, there is no requirement for visitor parking, although the 1.5 creates visitor parking. So in this instance, these units are providing two spaces per unit, which is in, in excess of the 1.5 required by the zoning bylaw. Assuming half the garage isn't taken <laughs> up with other stuff. Correct. Okay, thank you. Councilman McCurry. Mayor, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, what's the width of the street, the city street in front of these units? In front of these units, I, I'll have to defer to uh, uh, Gary Peaver, but I believe it's a, a 20 meter right of way, but it could be, uh, it could be more, sorry. Sorry, Tyler Wright's coming up. Uh, Tyler Wright, project manager of development. Um, there's different, uh, oh, sorry, through the chair, there's different right of way ways depending on what street you're uh, referring to. Strickland sure. Avenue, which is on the north side yeah. of the townhouse developments, is a 24 and a half meter collector road. Yeah. Um, Eccleston, which is on the south side of these townhouse developments, is an 18 and a half meter right of way. Um, that's a local road cross section. Um, the actual asphalt width varies for both roads depending on the parking requirements. Um, but all of the roads uh, and right-of-ways are within uh, city standard. Uh, and so what, what, uh, what, what parking is going to be permitted on these two streets? Uh, On-street parking will be uh, permitted on uh, both the streets in accordance with our uh, linear design manuals and cross-sections. Um, driveways are located on Eccleston Street on the south side because there's uh, street fronting single uh, lots. But the benefit of this uh, townhouse product is because there are no driveways uh, on the right of ways, the full streets, um, so Eccleston and Strickland, that promotes additional on-street parking um, because we know that that's uh, one of the topics of uh, debate here with the city and development is to provide as much on-street parking as we can. So that's one of the side benefits of this type of product is that that um, affords for additional on-street parking. Yeah, so the parking is continuous from one end to the other because it's not interrupted by driveways. Uh, Correct, provided for hydrants and other uh, items such as that, but uh, for yeah. the most part, yes, that's correct. Yeah, excellent. Now, um, thank you for that. Um, Casey, I heard you say there was a one foot setback. Uh, I wasn't sure what, from what? The side yard? Through the chair. Uh, I may have said one foot. I'm, I probably well, you said meant 0.3 one, meter. I, okay. Yes, my brain converts. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 0.3 meters from the uh, rear right of way to the garage. Okay. They're also requesting a 0.3 meter from the interior lot line to the edge of the uh, pavement in those instances where they have uh, a single driveway. Okay, and what's the setback on the front of the house? Through the chair, the setbacks to the front of the house are reduced um, in this instance because they are uh, street fronting, yeah. um, I can get you that number. I don't have it in front of me at the uh, at the moment, but I can certainly look it up right away. Um, the distance between back of house and front of garage, do you know that one as well? I will get that for you. <laughs> Those are my questions. Yeah. Councillor Sicoli. Thank you. Casey, you indicated that each of these townhomes, the lane townhomes have two parking spots. For my own brain, and it might be that I just haven't had my afternoon coffee, is it the parking garage, the, the garage that counts as two? And we're allowed to count those according to our bylaw because they're not tandem, right? They're side by side. So we're allowed to include the garage in this case through the chair that's correct so it's a it's a double width okay. um driveway so it would each of those spaces would be required be in the required parking i just wanted to highlight that because yeah. we just sim had something similar but because it was tandem we couldn't count that thank you so much okay, see i think that's it thanks very much So now I'll ask the uh, the applicant again if 
there is anything you uh, want to, uh, David, if there's anything else you want to say in addition to what you said previously or responding to uh, some of the information discussed with our planning staff person. Just need to take your, engage your video, please. I can see that he's in the waiting room. But. Uh, Mr. Folletta, did you want to respond, take advantage of the opportunity you have to provide a reply? It would appear not. All right, so let's move into uh, the discussion phase now that the public hearing has ended. And I believe Councillor Bannerstell, you've got the motion. Would you please confirm that, read it, and state your seconder. I will, thank you, Mr. Mayor, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Sicoli. A, that zoning bylaw amendment application PZ0822 submitted by Mousefield Incorporated on behalf of Shelburne Development Limited, affected lands at 346 Shellard Lane, City of Brantford be approved. To one, change the zoning on a portion of the lands from planned unit development type one zone, PUDI or PUD1, to holding residential type 1D exception zone um, and holding residential type 1D exception 12 zone. And two, change the zoning on a portion of the lands from holding community center commercial exception 7 zone to holding community center commercial zone C10. And three, amend the holding residential minimum density type A exception 78 zone applying to the near laneway accessory garages in order to increase the maximum lot coverage from 10 to 20 percent <throat> to increase the height of the accessory structures from four and a half meters to five meters reduce the rear and interior yard setback for accessory structures from 0.6 to 0.3 meters permit a 0, 0.0 meter setback for common walls and to permit a parking space to be permitted within 0.3 meters of any interior lot line or rear lot line in accordance with the applicable provisions as noted in section 9.2 of the report 2022-434. And B, that pursuant to section 3418 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, uh, CP 13, the following statement shall be included in the notice of decision. A regard has been had for all written and oral submissions received from the public before the decision was made in relation to this planning matter as discussed in section 8.2 of the report 2022-434. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before we I ask if any members were interested in discussing this, I should also confirm that we had no member of the public present in the chamber and we had no virtual delegations registered. So any discussion? Councilor McCreary. Uh, Mayor, thank you. I can see that staff are, are very interested to, to speak to me about the answers to my questions. Through Mayor Davis, yes, uh, I have found the setbacks for you. So the front yard setback from the front street to the dwelling is 3.5 meters. The setback between the rear of the dwelling and the face of the garage, so the closest point of the garage, is five meters. Thank you for that. Um, these, you know, uh, having lived in a municipality where we enjoyed uh, laneways, alleyways, and garages off them, um, it's it really is a it really is beneficial because you have your backyard, your garage behind you. And you've got the whole street in front of you for visitor parking. Um, so this is a it's a pretty good development. Uh, not a heck of a lot of room for the kids and the dog to play in in the backyard, but folks will make those choices, I guess. If they have a dog, maybe that's not for them. And if they have six kids, maybe you want to live in the county. I don't know. Um, so I'm happy to support this today. It, it seems like a pretty good housing type. Um, I, uh, I'd much prefer to see this than than the uh, the trend we see with stacked townhouses. Thank you.
Not seeing any other uh, requests to speak. Uh, Deputy Clerk, please take the vote. Item 5.3, CARES unanimously on recorded vote of seven to zero. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Slas, Smarn, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. All right, we'll now move on to item 5.4, which is an application for official plan amendment of OP 0122 zoning bylaw amendment, bylaw amendment PZ 1122, 800 Colburn Street. And I now ask the applicant to appear before the committee. Uh, Robert Phillips uh, on behalf of Plentitude Inc. So Bob, if you're there. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship, members of the Planning Committee. It's Bob Phillips from JH Cahoon Engineering Limited. Uh, we're here on behalf of Plentitude Inc., who are proposing a nine unit uh townhouse development on the property at 800 colburn street uh east this is uh located uh, directly to the east of uh the smith pharmacy uh that's located on colburn street uh it's a remnant uh, parcel of land uh that was severed approximately a year year and a half ago uh from the uh uh the pharmacy property, and it was always envisioned to be a, uh, a small residential development. Uh, the proposal here is, as I mentioned, nine uh, townhouse units, a uh, little bit different format. There's a four unit block, a three unit block, and a two unit block uh, uh, being proposed here. Uh, there was, Two or three items uh, that that were not uh, uh, that don't meet the, the, the zoning requirements here. Um, one was a, a little bit of a rear yard uh, reduction from seven and a half down to six. Uh, the uh, in an R four A zone, there certainly is a, a requirement for amenity space, but uh, unlike not unlike uh, most residential units, they've got a rear yard. So they, they do have amenity space. Uh, we meet the parking requirements. Uh, and then there's a small provision because the uh, entrance into uh, the property is limited. Uh, the property is only 11 meters wide. And by the time we uh, get a road in there, there's not much left over. So. They've reduced the uh, front yard landscaping requirements uh, because the front yards typically it's out by the, the road where the frontage is. Um, we've read the planning staff report are fully supportive of it um, in all the conditions. Uh, we note the comments in the back that will get addressed through the site plan approval process. There's some minor tweaks to the plan uh, but uh, short of that, I'm here to answer any questions. We do want to have one small request. Uh, at the 24th hour, the requirement for an OP amendment uh, was indicated to us. And although some of the planners had some uh, differences of opinion about whether that was required, we submitted it. And we would just ask that the fee be refunded if, the, if council sees fit. Um, as I mentioned, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, we have uh, the owners actually on the call as well. Um, if if there's questions for her, um, other than that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, Councillor Vanderstel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Bob. Um, as I understand it, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the total maximum stories here in this section is uh, in this proposed development is two story and nothing above that. That's correct. And uh, I think you'll see in the uh, zoning uh, provisions that that is the maximum. And that's okay. what we're proposing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
don't think there are any other any other questions, Bob. But uh, oh, sorry, Constant Carpenter. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Bob, the applicant is also committed to uh, fencing the entire property. Is he not, or is she not? I should say. That's correct, and and that certainly would probably be one of the first items that uh, would happen during the construction process. Yeah, you're going to have fencing and, and security on site, as I recall. Uh, and uh, I, I did get an uh, email recently from a resident from James Ave. Uh, now, units uh, six, seven, eight, and nine, would it be possible to, uh, the, the back of those lots, the back onto the James Avenue properties, the one, especially number nine, has a pool close to the back there. Are we able to plant extra trees across the back there? I will. On, on, you know, on I, I appreciate the, the comment, uh, you know, certainly something that we'd look at through site plan approval and, yep. and I don't really see it as being a problem, but we do have a bit of a, a reduced rear yard. So I think some careful planning is going to be required there. Yeah, but, they may uh, have to be appreciate the comment. They may have to be cedars. And the reason for the OP application is the, the confusion there was uh, because the city had done their official plan and made this intensification corridor, it actually required higher density here and uh, and our planning staff uh, without the op as the, the discussion went would require this this op amendment because uh they want higher density and the applicant wants lower density as being proposed that, that's correct and uh, if you recall at the neighborhood meeting uh there was in no uncertain terms the uh the neighborhood didn't want any uh more intensive a development on this site Okay, thank you, Bob. I do have an amendment that I'll be dealing with the, the, that issue. Thank you. I think that's, that's it, Bob. No further questions at this time. Thank you. So we'll go back to Nicole Goodbrand is going to do the presentation by planning. And thank you through you, Chair. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an application uh, as it pertains to 800 Colburn Street. The property is currently uh, designated uh, through the intensification corridor land use designation and zoned residential type 1B and resident residential type 1D. The application, or, sorry, excuse me, the applicant is requesting to amend the official plan to include a new modified policy area to permit the low density residential development, as we were just kind of speaking about, and to rezone uh, the property to residential medium density type A with a site specific exception. And that exception would be to permit the semi-detached dwellings in addition to block townhouses, a reduction in the rear yard setback, as Bob mentioned, a reduction in the side yard setback for an exterior wall, a reduction in amenity space, and a reduction in the required landscape open space in the front yard. Next slide, please. Uh, so the property uh, is located in the Echo Place neighborhood and the surrounding land uses in the broader neighborhood are primarily residential with commercial uses, of course, lining uh, the Colburn Street corridor. The property is approximately 0 0.31 hectares or just over 3,000 uh, square meters in size. Next slide, please. So as Bob mentioned, the applicant is proposing to develop the property into nine dwelling units, um, which based on our definitions in the zoning bylaw would include seven block townhouses, a block of four, a block of three, and then one semi-detached dwelling. Uh, so essentially a townhouse, but with only two um, uh, dwelling units included. Uh, next slide, please. As with all of our applications, this application was evaluated uh, with respect to the policies contained in the provincial policy statement, the growth plan, and the city's official plan. Section 1.1 of the PPS promotes efficient development and land use patterns, which minimizes land use consumption and servicing costs. 
And it also includes policies that focus growth in existing settlement areas, encourages intensification and redevelopment, as well as making more efficient use of existing infrastructure and public facilities. And the growth plan similarly provides policies surrounding complete communities um, that are encouraged to accommodate the forecasted growth. Um, by providing convenient access to appropriate mix of jobs, local services, public service facilities, and a full range of housing uh, to accommodate the future incomes and household sizes. Complete communities um, are encouraged, are supported, excuse me, by encouraging the use of active transportation and providing a high quality uh, public open space, adequate parkland, and opportunities for recreation, as well as access to local and healthy food. Next slide, please. So as Bob mentioned, there is a proposal uh, for an official plan amendment. So the official existing official plan designation is the intensification corridor, which is intended to function as the connective spine, I think as committee is well aware. And it supports a variety of uses, including retail and service commercial, which we see along that corridor, office uses, hotels, and residential uses, typically in mid to high rise forms. This site is subject to policy, modified policy area uh, 25, which uh, identifies the following. Um, so it recognizes the market dynamics and travel patterns uh, that in the past supported the motel strip along Cobra Street East. Um, and to facilitate the regeneration and neighborhood revitalization in the area, the existing motels and other auto-oriented uses on the lands, identified as Area 25, are encouraged to re redevelop into new mixed-use buildings as permitted in the intensification corridor designation. Um, and there's also reference to the opportunity for fi financial incentives through the CIP programs. So the, application, the applicant is proposing uh, an amendment to the official plan to add an additional policy area to the lands, which per, would permit the proposed residential use of the low rise building form, that being the two stories that Councillor Vanderson identified. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, within that, as I mentioned before, it currently, the property is currently zoned R1B and R1D, and the applicant is requesting to rezone to R4A to permit those nine dwelling units. Next slide, please. So to support that proposed development, as Bob um, went over, we're looking to permit the use of a semi-detached dwelling unit. Um, as Bob mentioned, essentially this is to address the proposed townhouse, uh, quote unquote, which only has two units. Um, so that doesn't meet the definition in the zoning by law of a block townhouse. Uh, so that is to kind of bridge that gap. The applicant is also requesting a reduced rear yard setback, which would be from 7.5 meters to six meters, a reduced side yard setback from three meters to 1.2 meters, and a further reduction uh, to amenity space from nine square meters per unit to zero. And that uh, in lieu of that amenity space, they're proposing uh, that private amenity, amenity space be provided with each unit. And the final component, uh, which Bob also mentioned, uh, that is being asked through the zoning bylaw amendment pertains to the landscape open space in the front yard specifically. Um, so we do have a clause in the zoning bylaw that requires 50% of the front yard of all properties in the residential zones to be landscaped open space. In this case, it's an 11 meter frontage um, as was permitted through consent, um, but with the approximately 8.5, six meter uh, two way driveway as well as sidewalk in space, um, it, it would be limited in the amount of space for landscaping. Next slide, please. In regards to public input, a hybrid neighborhood was held on May 19th and we had nine participants attend. Uh, the meeting was also available online and members of the public uh, that attended as well as provided comments were supportive of the proposed design with nine dwelling units at the height of two stories. Um, and as uh, Councilor Carpenter and Bob mentioned, um, the comments expressed by the neighborhood were primarily focused on reinforcing support for the proposed design um, as an opposition of an increased density as was we would typically, typically expect in the intensification corridor. Um, so the notices were provided as always uh, within the 120 meter radius as required through the Planning Act. Next slide, please. Um, so staff have done a high level calculation uh, for land, looking at single detached versus the dwelling units proposed. 
So there are assumptions made um, regarding the size of a single detached, relating it to the R1D, which actually previously existed on the site or currently exists on a portion of it. Um, so based on the proposed, um, the uh, nine units would typically require um, two, uh, 2,430 square meters with the R1D zone and an additionally 81 meters of frontage. Of course, in this case, we're looking at a slightly more given the uh, square footage based on the shape of the site. It's basically shaped like a flag. Um, but when you consider the land that's actually being used for residential development and take into consideration the frontage that is being utilized um, and kind of the location of the lands, um, it does provide in a more efficient use of existing land within our, our built up area. Next slide, please. In regards to development considerations, uh, we've had specific focus on the public input, the site plan, uh, site plan control, and noise and noise studies, and compatibility in urban design. So as identified previously, public input was provided and written comments and comments received during the neighborhood meeting. Um, and again, those were ma mainly focused on um, reinforcing the support for the application and showing opposition for a higher density than what was being proposed. Um, in regards to the specific detail of the proposed development, as Bob alluded to, of course, the site is or would be subject to site plan. Um, and that site plan control uh, would help facilitate the development of the subject lands in collaboration with the board councillors. Um, in regards to noise, the subject is in close proximity to Colburn Street, being with frontage right on it. And so a noise study was required. In this case, the study found that the proposed noise from the abutting street could be mitigated through the provision of forced air heating and central air. Um, and finally, uh, staff evaluated the overall application based on the compatibility and urban design identified in the conceptual, sub con conceptual submissions. Staff evaluated that the urban design brief provided by J.H. Cahoon um, and through that design, or through that report, I should say, the proposed development uh, maintains co cohesion with the surrounding neighborhood through the low-rise townhouse design. It is the opinion of staff that the proposed development represents compact residential development that makes efficient use of land and infrastructure and contributes to the provision of a full range of housing and supports multimodal transportation as is required through the provincial planning directives. The placement of buildings also enables the proposed uh, parking to be located internally to the site and it's largely shielded from public view, um, thus reducing the visual impact of the parking and really of the residential uh, units themselves. Next slide, please. So uh, in conclusion, uh, is staff opinion that the proposal represents int uh, good intensification within the built uh, boundary and is an, an infill development, which provides, uh, again, that wonderful opportunity for intensification on a previously vacant uh, piece of land. It aligns with the pro provincial recommendations from the Housing Affordability Task Force and is consist consistent, goodness, with provincial policy statement, the growth plan, and the city's official plan. Next slide, please. To conclude, staff are recommending that the lands be rezoned and um, redesignated as outlined in the staff report. Staff support the application as amended as they're consistent with the PPS, the growth plan and official plan and represent good planning. And I'm happy to take any questions. So any questions for Nicole? Seeing none, thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, this is the stage of the public hearing where we open the uh, floor to comments from the public, either for, in for it, either in support of or in opposition to the application. Uh, there is uh, no other no member of the public in the chamber itself, and we've had uh, no one registered to, to attend virtually. So, I'll ask then Bob if, if there's anything you want to say in summation to the application. No, I think uh, Nicole did a fabulous job, uh, even with the details, and uh, I'm just uh, pleased with uh, the way the meeting went. So uh, we're looking for your support tonight, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Councillor Carpenter, did you want to ask a question? No, I'm just ready to move the 
resolution. Okay. I think it's got Council Wall, but it's in Ward 4. All right. Yeah, it's in Ward 4. So, uh, Council Carpenter, why don't you move this seeking a seconder if you can read the resolution? Thank you. It's moved by myself seeking a seconder. I see Council Wall's over there. Maybe we put my second. Thank you, Council Wall. And I just apologize for my ward mate, Councilor Ntoski. She's had a, a serious injury in the family and cannot attend here tonight. It's not her, but it's uh, something she has to attend to. Otherwise, she would be here. That official plan amendment application OP 10122 submitted by JH Cahoon Engineering Limited on behalf of Plentitude Incorporated affecting the lands located on the north side of Corbin Street on the east side of James Avenue. This will be addressed as 800 Corbin Street be approved. And that zoning bylaw amendment application PZ 1122 submitted by JH Cahoon Engineering Limited on behalf of Plentitude Incorporated affecting lands at 800 Corbin Street to change the zoning of the lands from residential type 1B 15 meter zone to R1B and residential type 1D nine meter zone to residential medium density type R4A exception 82 zone, R4A 82 to permit seven townhouse dwellings and two semi-detached dwelling units be approved in accordance with the applicable provisions as noted in section 9.2 of the report uh, 2022-409. And that C that pursuant to the section 17, subsection 23, one and 34, subsection 18.1 of the Planning Act RSO 1990, uh, the following statement shall include in, in the notice of decision. Regard has been had for all written and oral submissions received from the public before the decision was made in relation to this planning matter as discussed in section 82 of the report. And if I may speak to it, uh, we we had uh, we had ward meetings with the residents. First of all, we met with the residents on Avondale Street uh, to discuss the application. We had the pictures of the design and the, the two-story design and the style. And uh, we had the discussion with residents what could go there as opposed to what this uh, developer was proposing. And uh, having being realistic in the neighborhood, uh, there's a uh, most of the neighbors there on Avondale have large gardens in their backyard. Um, and we're, you know, they hadn't used to having something behind them. Uh, the setbacks here are going to work for them, won't affect their gardens. Uh, they were quite happy with the development. Uh, and even when we had the public meeting on May 19th, they all came and they were very pleased with the development and met the developer again. And we're happy with the developer proposal and the kind of style they're going to maintain with this development, a two story, very high end development is in keeping with the neighborhood. And the only concern that we that we get, did receive was some residents thought we could flip the development, but you see it's flag shaped. It can't be flipped for the roadway going in and it's uh, back in farther. But the it is an intensification corridor and it, it was one of those developments that got caught in between what was our official plan amendment and the start of the application in the first place. The official plan uh, uh, review got passed and they were had already started their application. And so they would what's the official plan calls for is three story stacked towns here or three stories minimum. And in order to not do that, they had to do a Fisher plan amendment to meet the two story. So I have an amendment to actually refund their application for the, just for the Fisher plan amendment piece of it because they were caught in between the official plan and, 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 uh, and the policy. So uh, having said that, I know there's another one on the, on the other books coming from Council McCurry in a similar vein. Um, staff have, have the resolution, Mr. Clerk, could you put the amendment on the floor, please, if I may, at this time, Mr. Mayor. Yes. And the amendment's been discussed with staff. The staff wrote this amendment for me. The staff would direct to refund the planning application fee portion of the official, of the official plan amendment only. Uh, 800 Corp Street as a training's application, OP01 2022. And I believe it's, uh, staff can tell me the cost. I think it's 14,000 or something like that. It's not the, it's not all the, it's not the application fees, just the OP fee. Thank you. I'm oh, seeking a seconder. Yeah, I'm seeking a seconder. I think Councillor Sicoli is seconding it. All right, to the amendment. Any discussion? Saying none. Mr. Deputy Clerk, please take the vote. The amendment to item 5.4 carries unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Celeste, Smarn, Wall, Carpenter, McCreary, Sokoli, and Mayor Davis. Councillor Carpenter, to the amended resolution. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and to the committee. Thank you to the committee. Uh, the developer is very concerned about, uh, very supportive of our city and very, very impressed with our planning department and the work that we've done here. And uh, they are, I, 
introduce them to our policies and review of our, our incentives for developing the old hotel properties along Coburn Street. And uh, has since had a meeting with them uh, via Zoom to show them all our policies and procedures of which, what we're looking at as far as redeveloping old brownfield sites and affordable housing units. And they're very interested in, in being part of that program in our city coming forward. Just want to give that shout, shout out to them. Thank you. So, no further comment. Uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, please take the vote. Item 5.4 as amended, CARES unanimously on recorded vote of eight to zero. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanner, Steltz, Les, Martin, Wall, Carpenter, McCreary, Sicoli, and Mayor Davis. All right, so we previously dealt with uh, 7.1.1 on consent. That moving then to section eight resolutions and I'll pass the chair over to Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're now in resolutions and I have a resolution of future consent and minor grants application to committee of adjustment for 250 Memorial Drive. Councilor McCreary, you have the floor, sir. Could you please move your motion and, and name your seconder. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the seconder is Councilor Martin. Uh, reads as follows. Uh, whereas the owner applicant of the property at 251 Memorial Drive is seeking to waive two future planning app fees for consent and minor variance for the redevelopment on the lands to create a proposed new building lot for a single detached dwelling. And whereas the applicant applied for similar applications in 2017 under the previous OP and current zoning bylaw, which was supported by planning staff and subsequently denied by committee of adjustment. And whereas the app was appealed to the LPAT uh, by the applicant and was also denied on November 27, 2017. And whereas the OP came into force and effect on August 5, 21 and establishes a new planning policy framework. And whereas the applicant had previously paid the corresponding planning fees to the corporation of the city of Brantford is agreeable to the payment of one consent app fee for this new submission in the amount of $3,280. Uh, now therefore be it resolved that city council waived the respective combined planning fee for one consent and one minor variance totaling $4,500 for the lands located at 251 Memorial Drive. And uh, just briefly, uh, Mr. Chair, um, it's just an issue of fairness and staff and the applicant are both uh, in agreement with this. And I would hope everybody would be supportive. <laughs> I, I'm the chair, sorry. <laughs> I lost track. I was so impressed by how Council McCurry did that. Now, I've noticed any comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. <laughs> Went to sleep on us. <laughs> Item 8.1 cares unanimously on a recorded vote. <laughs> Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councillors Vanderstelt, Slash, Smarn, Wall, Carpenter, McCreary, and Socoli. 8.2, it's my understanding that Councilman McCreary wishes to waive the rules to bring forward a late motion, notice of motion as, as a resolution for consideration this afternoon. This will require a two-thirds vote. Councilman McCreary, please move the motion to waive the rules for your notice and motion and state your second. Chair, thank you. Councilman Martin is the seconder. Uh, reads as follows that uh, section 1511.5 of the procedural bylaw be waived in order to produce a notice of motion as a resolution without prior notice. Whereas communities and neighborhoods are immeasurably improved by the presence and addition of modern, safe, and challenging playground equipment, and whereas young children, their friends, and parents benefit from the interactions experienced on and around playground equipment, and whereas the city of Brantford closely monitors its owned and operated playground equipment at dozens of city park locations, and whereas the city of Brantford replaces such equipment as it passes beyond its safe and useful lifetime, and whereas Greenbrier School Park is maintained and operated by the Grand Erie District School Board, and whereas the um, Greenbrier Neighborhood Association and Greenbrier Parent Council has identified the need for modern, safe and challenging playground equipment in the Greenfield School Park. And whereas the Greenbrier Neighborhood Association Greenbrier Parent Council has had discussions with playground manufacturers and created a design for an appropriate playground at that location. And whereas the Greenbrier Neighborhood Association and Greenbrier Parent Council has undertaken the task of raising money for the supply and installation. And whereas to date, the Greenbrier Neighborhood Association and Greenbrier Parent Council has raised more than $40,000. And whereas the city of Brantford has in the past demonstrated support for neighborhood associations by cost sharing the construction of uh, neighborhood uh, driven playground initiatives. And whereas there's a desire to have the playground installed during 2022. And whereas with the financial support of the city of Brantford, that time frame can be met. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that upon receipt by the city of the financials and playground design from Greenbrier Neighborhood Association and the Greenbrier Parent Council at up to $30,000 for playground equipment for the new Greenbrier Park be approved from capital project PK 2213 playground rehabilitation and replacement program. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Any members with Councilor Martin? Timing. Yeah, this is timely because uh, just on Tuesday, we approved the, the leasing of land from the school board at Greenbrier School. So this is the playground equipment that will go on the land that's newly leased by the city. So it, uh, this needs to be done in conjunction with that. And that's speaking to time. Anyway, other comments speaking to time? Okay, this requires two thirds vote. So uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the question on the two thirds. Item 8.2, motion to waive the rules, carries on a recorded vote of eight to zero with the required two thirds vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Van der Stelt, Celeste, Martin, Wall, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. Okay, as the motion carried on the more than two thirds uh, as required, I uh, ask the motion to waive the rules have been carried. I ask now Councilor McCreary to please move item 8.2 and state your seconder again, but you no longer need to read the motion. Thank you for that, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, the seconder is Councillor Martin. Uh, and uh, just speaking to it, um, this is an initiative that, that the community has put together for us and, and the ward councillors have, have uh, helped a little bit uh, in terms of bringing it here tonight. I also want to express um, gratitude to Mr. Cox and the crew who were involved in negotiating the lease for the property. Uh, so the playground can be enjoyed by everyone um, during the hours in which um, access is granted to city parks. So we'll, we'll have that same right uh, here. Um, typically in, in, in school park locations, sometimes the principal will choose to exclude the public uh, during school hours. And, and we were looking to maximize this. So the discussions were rather protracted and thus the need for our hurry up offense uh, in uh, this cycle of council so we can get this approved, uh, ratified at council at the end of the month and then uh, city staff can work with the folks on the parent council neighborhood association to bring this to fruition. Um, so I would hope that everybody uh, can support this tonight. I'll remind um, some folks that uh, it's quite similar to what we did at Tootla Park uh, going back a number of years ago where the community drove that project and um, uh, this council supported it with, uh, with, with our contribution as well. So um, please uh, support this and uh, we'll look forward to uh, getting this in the ground hopefully before the snow flies. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Any more comments on this? I've seen Councilor Martin. Did you get your mic on or no? You're okay? Nope. Okay. Seeing no further comments on this, I'll call the question. Item 8.2 carries unanimous on recorded vote of 8 to 0. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councilors Van der Celts, Marn, Wall, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. And there are no notices, motions on the agenda tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you to staff for such a long day and council members and committee members.